Test, test. Okay, perfect. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to WordCamp US 2019, Saturday morning. We're excited to be here in St. Louis. My name is David. I'll be your host this morning uh, until uh, 10.30. Before we start, I'd just like to go over a few quick announcements. Uh, please silence all of your cell phones and other electronic devices. Uh, please move to the center to make it easier to get to the microphones and so other people can enter the room easily. If anyone has any additional accessibility needs that we may be able to help you uh, assist you with, or if you have any other questions, our room manager is there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I can't see you. Um, there will be a Q&A after each session. Uh, please use the mics at all times so people on the live stream can, um, and those providing answers can hear you. In the interest of time, please hold all questions until the end of each presentation. Uh, think about your question ahead of time as, so that it is a question and not a statement. Please keep your question as brief and to the point so we can get in as many as possible. If you'd like to speak to the presenter at length, ask if they're opening to continuing the discussion later on at the support desk or in the sponsor hall. And we want to encourage everyone to come to Contributor Day on Sunday. If you've never been to Contributor Day before and want to know what it's about, please visit the Get Involved table in the sponsor hall or attend one of the sessions entitled Everyone Can Help Make WordPress Better, How to Contribute to WordPress. Good morning, everybody. Oh, this is on. Is it on? Can you hear me? Oh, it is on. I feel like the most anticlimactic rock star of all time. <laughs> a little bit of applause to make him feel better. Beautiful. Well, thanks, everybody, for coming out for our first session of the second day. Uh, my name is Jenny. I will be your moderator today. Uh, and we've got a really interesting topic for you. It's auto-updates for WordPress. So um, who was at the State of the Word last year? OK, good amount of people. Uh, so as you might remember, uh, during the last State of the Word, uh, Matt Mullenweg, our co-founder of WordPress, uh, talked a lot about uh, automatic updates for WordPress sites. And he suggested that this year, 2019, uh, we would be looking at uh, providing a way for users to opt into automatic updates of core, plugins, and themes. Of course, this was never going to be without controversy. Uh, and to discuss this topic, I have with me here Jake Spurlock. Uh, Jake is WordPress security release lead and a technical account manager at WordPress.com VIP. We've also got Mika Epstein, a plugin review team lead and an engineer at DreamHost, and Andrew Nason a longtime core developer of WordPress. Uh, and just to let you know, so we're going to run through some uh, questions that we've already discussed. And at the end, we're going to have some open Q&A time. Um, we've got a mic over here. So at the end, we'll have people come up uh, to ask their questions. So let's dig in. Uh, Nason, your first step. You were here ages ago when WordPress made it possible to update, to auto-update uh, between minor releases. How does that differ from updating between major releases? Oh boy, okay. Um, I'm gonna take a step back and start with like some history, which I think might be useful. Um, I was not here ages ago, <laughs> but I was here some time ago. It's um, been longer than you think. Yeah, uh, so for those who don't know, I uh, helped lead the uh, WordPress core development process for a number of years, uh, I was around from probably around 2009 starting, give or take, uh, but this starts even before then. Um, and it goes back to um, really in earnest like um, 2007 um, and 2008. And what we had at the time was in order to update WordPress, and some of you I hope remember this, um, you had to like, typically speaking, you'd be copying files up through FTP. And that's how you would update WordPress and it would be a slow, painful process, obviously not particular, like required some technical knowledge and know-how. Um, and then we got to this point where in WordPress 2.7, uh, we were able to add, I say we, I was not, I, I was still in college, um, added, a, added a button to the dashboard that said update automatically. 
Um, and that was the automatic update, was the button. Um, and online, actually, so we have this really great page on WordPress.org on, called uh, on philosophies, and it talks about like striving for simplicity is one of our philosophies, and it says how we were able to reduce updates down to just a single click, and that was like our ability to, that was our way to get more simple here. Um, in reality, that was not an automatic update by any means because it still required a button click and it was a lot of overhead. Uh, and now that button just says update now because what an automatic update is now to us is this idea of like WordPress being able to update in the background. And uh, that was added in uh, 2013 in WordPress 3.7, which is the lease that I led. Uh, and we spent a long time trying to like get this right in a lot of different ways. Um, it supports, for example, the ability to update major releases uh, already, and that's been there for now six years. Um, and in particular, uh, in, for WordPress 5.2, uh, almost 30% of all of those releases, uh, of all of those uh, downloads were automatic updates for the major release version. That's everyone turning it on already, uh, mostly hosting companies and things like that. So thank you, appreciate it. Um, it makes our life easier too. Yeah, and so there's a lot of different threads here and I wanna kinda like break this up into component parts and that like we want WordPress, and we'll talk about this, like we want WordPress to be able to just always stay up to date. Plugins, themes, core, language packs that plays better in WordCamp Europe. Um, <laughs> and then separately there's been this, this other conversation about like, and we also wanna update older sites. Um, but I want to make sure that we think of these as like two different pieces because they really are. Uh, they're both very important in a lot of ways uh, for uh, uh, all sorts of reasons, whether it's both usability, simplicity, security, reliability. But uh, they, are, they, they are like separate pieces. Um, and so like, yeah, it's, it's going to be a bit different, but we also, we're, I mean, the, the software needs to go in this direction. Thank you. Mika. You work across a lot of different spaces in the WordPress project. Uh, what are your biggest concerns with creating this functionality? I have a very broad and diverse view of the WordPress ecosystem. I started out supporting in the WordPress forums when I was bored watching my code compile working at a bank. I was one of the only and the youngest DOS experts at a bank. And it takes a long time for code to compile back in the, uh, in the 90s. So I played on the forums. I learned how to do a few things with WordPress. That led to me learning multi-site and then to pestering the plugins team, like, did you see all these problems? They gave me access and here I am today. I work as a full stack developer for DreamHost in Los Angeles and I'm the lead for the plugin review team, which means I've basically looked at every single plugin that has been submitted for the last five years. I cannot remember all of them, it's okay. But because of that, I see the integration of WordPress and practical use in a different way than people who are just involved in core development. I see the crazy things that customers at DreamHost are doing. Some of them are, they blow my mind when I'm like, you're using WordPress to do that, okay. I myself use WordPress to do very peculiar things that WordPress was not intended to do, and yet is extensible to do it. And it's that extendability that concerns me when we talk about automatic updates, because while we do know a lot about the ecosystem on .org and the plugins that we host and the themes that we host, there is an enormous world out there. We have roughly 80,000 plugins, some open, some closed, on WordPress.org. We don't have a way of testing all of them against each other. They're all written from a varying degree of expertise. Some people, it's their very first plugin. It does one thing very well. Some people have written 40 plugins. And even then, they don't all show the same level of care and development. We can't test them the way that we test core. We don't have a beta system, a release candidate system. So when we start talking, we're gonna auto update, my concerns start with how do we make sure that the people that aren't updating their plugins or who have bespoke or abandoned plugins or even just plugins that aren't written that well that they got from a nulled site, how do we know we're not gonna hurt them? And the good news is that with the minor updates and with the health check that we've built in, we do a lot of those checks already. 
So we're, we're noticing, hey, we, we can't finish the update, we're gonna roll back. And we can start expanding on that. So my concern really is just, have we done enough there to make sure that we're not gonna hurt the people that aren't really paying attention to what their site is doing because we've already taught them, you don't have to worry about auto updates, we'll take care of that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Jake, you currently work on the security team, uh, but also with a lot of enterprise clients. Do you think there's a problem that this functionality solves? Well, <clears throat> I guess I wanna be pretty clear on the like enterprise front. One thing that's nice about enterprise grade WordPress is uh, things like updates are largely like core, people that are kind of at that enterprise level aren't gonna be using the normal like updater system anyways. Um, updates are gonna be controlled by a build process. You know, it might be an SVN checkout, it might be something like that, but for the most part, people in the enterprise are going to be not using WordPress auto updates to begin with. Uh, like Nathan mentioned, for 5.2, the almost 30% of those updates came from, came to, via auto updates, and that's largely from hosts, that's largely from platforms, um, and so that's something that's really not the case for enterprise anyways. Um, so I don't think that enterprise is something or somebody that would necessarily benefit from this to begin with, but I do think it's an exciting thing to add for all of the people that are part of like those enterprise platforms to begin with. Um, as far as security goes, like, uh, I think that the, the most important thing here is we want everybody to be on one version of WordPress. That's the most secure way that we can develop WordPress. And there's a lot of benefits for that. Um, right now we are supporting a lot. We're supporting 16 versions of WordPress. And I don't want to say that's not feasible and it's not possible. We're doing it right now. Um, but I think that in the future we want to be in a place where everybody is on the same code base and we can support WordPress that way. Better for users, too. Absolutely. Better for compatibility. If everyone's on the same version of WordPress, theme and plugin developers don't have to stress so much about, I have to test and make sure you have this version of WordPress or greater, this version of PHP or greater. You'll know where the minimum is. All right. Uh, let's then talk about updating older sites. Uh, that has recently generated some controversy. Uh, and some of the questions are around the legality of the work. Um, Nathan, you want to jump on this one? No, I don't, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, this one's really interesting because it ties into, um, into privacy and consent and um, a lot of really interesting topics that... Um, in a lot of ways, like WordPress moved a lot faster than what a lot of the conversations that obviously we're having now in this space, which I think is it's good, it's very healthy that we're having a lot of these conversations now. Um, the, the main goal that we have in this case is we wanna be able to uh, help, our, help the users of WordPress as much as we possibly can. Um, from a legal standpoint, there's a lot of nuance here. I am not, none of us are lawyers. Um, uh, the lawyers that the, the project leaders have spoken to at this point basically said that it's really nuanced, but what you want to do is possible with some limitations, um, depending on, of course, jurisdiction and everything else. So, for example, in the EU, uh, as things are currently written um, in various privacy uh, regulations and laws, um, you can offer uh, an automatic update that's, pri that's uh, intended for security reasons, as long as um, you offer it to the user in the point where like, they're able to say, like, I don't want this right now. And like, basically, the main piece there is the communication. Um, there are a lot of other aspects here as well. Uh, obviously, like, laws change, uh, which is a whole other yeah. thing that we always have to keep in mind. Um, we're already in this point where, where sites are auto-updating as well. Um, they're already updating to, to the latest security release that we end up releasing. Uh, we would just be releasing more things that support that are for security purposes. There's a lot of there's a lot of nuance here. Um, I don't want to play lawyer for too much longer, so I'm going <laughs> to maybe stop there and see if any of you want to. Also, not a lawyer, daughter of a lawyer, but not a lawyer. Um, there are so many different laws that come into play, and there are so many different requirements and 
we are not naive enough to say that WordPress knows the answer to everything at this moment. And I don't think we will ever say that we know the answer to everything at any moment in time. But what we can say is that, as Nason mentioned, there are legal people that are looking into it and making sure that whatever decision we come to, the methodology is going to be what should be done. And, and what we're talking about here, just to provide a little bit more background, is that if you update to, let's say, WordPress 5 point something, and then it just kind of like puts you into a track where you're now able to maybe like ask for major release auto updates in the future, or maybe in a future point, uh, that's, not even, that's not even the case. You update to a version and now it's just like kind of putting you into that track by default. That's not the concern here. The concern here is uh, when we first started doing this, uh, WordPress 2.7, the idea was we were going to take like a good long vacation and then come back <laughs> and then build all of this for major release updates. Um, six years later, we're still at the point where it's like, all right, we should probably now like dig in and do this. But It was a really long vacation. It was a long vacation. Um, and the idea for, that we always had from the beginning was like, okay, when we get to like 3.8, 3.9, 4.0, eventually we're gonna update all the 3.7 sites to 3.8, and eventually all the 3.8 sites to 3.9, and all the 3.9 sites to 4.0. And now we're at the point where there's actually like 38,000 sites on 3.7. That's it. And they have all been auto-updated like 31 times. Fine. Like, that's great. I have a game that I play at DreamHost, which is if you can find me an old WordPress, I give you a prize every week. And <laughs> just last week, they found 2.8. I, I gave them a prize. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, released in, that was released in early 2009. The oldest we've ever found is a 1.6. I want to say it might have been 1.5, but we just 1. sort of, 5, yeah. we all sort of sat there and looked at it and going, it's still running. It works. They're happy. We just reached out to the customer and said, we have no idea if this is going to work when we upgrade your PHP. You might want to test. Can we help you? Yeah. So the, so the concern that we're talking about from like a legality standpoint is like, what, what are the, what are the consent mechanisms around the idea of someone uh, was automatically when they updated 3.7, they were uh, they were or they were put into this uh, this release channel where they were getting security they were getting security releases. What does it mean to then like update them across major branches, and do we have that consent to be able to do so? And there's, there's, there is honestly a lot of nuance here. Um, there's it, it's interesting. It's a really interesting conversation. I understand why a lot of people have a lot of like feelings and thoughts about this. Um, the main thing that I want to say is that this is the thing that we were always thinking about. We weren't thinking about this only because of Gutenberg, because really, like, that was not never the intention. I'm just noting that right now. No, but some of the lessons that we learned with upgrading to Gutenberg lead to how we want to handle this, like education. When you got Gutenberg, bef the release before, there was that nice big banner that said, hey, this thing is coming. You might want classic press. We have the ability to do those things, to let people know what's coming, so we can tackle the nuanced approach to what is the legality going to involve by giving security updates and educating people as to what's coming so we can meet the needs that we're going to be facing. Yeah, it's, it's definitely like a major like marketing slash messaging push for this. Like, we, we, we don't want to just roll this out. Like, that's not the intention here. The intention is to provide ways so that people are, you know, seeing the messaging, understanding the implications, and then doing it safely. And I think that with the health checks and the way the update system works, this is something that can be done at scale you know, very effectively. I just want to say, too, I'm not a lawyer also, but I play one on TV. <laughs> so one of the other things that's come up through the discussion around this is the uh, ethics and the morality of the question. So why do this? Is WordPress responsible for keeping individual sites safe? The genie's kind of out of the bottle on that already. We've been keeping people's sites up to date. and. Part of this discussion is what is the best way for us to continue to do this smartly, safely, securely for both the users and the people maintaining WordPress? What's the best way? I have a poster on my wall at home that is uh, Flynn Lives. And if you've seen the movie Tron, there's a nice thing where they say, I fight for the users. And I keep that on my wall to remind myself that the people I care about the most in the WordPress community are the people who aren't here, the people who are just using WordPress at home moms and pops, sores, my father, who still to his dying day could not figure out how to make a post on WordPress and just mailed me a PDF. <laughs> the people that use WordPress that have no understanding of these conversations, and to be perfectly fair, don't care. What they care is my site's up, it runs, I'm not gonna get hacked and it's gonna crash and I'm gonna have a really terrible day. And those are the people we need to be taking care of. Well, when we were talking, I mean, Jake and I were talking about this earlier, how yeah. like, this is, 
this is expected yeah. now. Like in 2013, maybe it was a little bit on the forefront of this. Like we, we used to talk about like, oh, we want to be like Chrome, right? Like we want to like update all the, all the time. And then people are like, well, you're not really a web browser. I'm like, okay, fine, we're not a web browser. But also now Windows is automatically updated. My Mac automatically updates. Your all phone the apps auto automatically update. Yeah. All the apps on my phone automatically update. We all are constantly using all these web applications that are on hosted services. They automatically update. For the most part, my WordPress automatically updates. Like, what's the like at this point? It's like a user expectation thing, and that ends up being really hard as well. Because like for the most part, people are like, I mean, there are some people like Mark who still really like to read the release notes on his iPhone, but like that's it, right? Like for the most part, everyone's just letting things go. We I'm can track wrong, who right? reads it, and we know it's only Mark. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay. And it, there's a lot of problems that we were talking about earlier in terms of like the the issues of like why do we want to do this and like. I think reasonable people disagree on this. Like in terms of is WordPress responsible for all the sites out there? Like I think it's totally reasonable to someone to feel like, no, you shouldn't feel that way. I'm like that's fine, I feel that way. And like a lot of code that all of us wrote is out there running on sites and like we have a, we feel responsibility for that. And it's, it's a blessing and a curse that WordPress is used by so many people and by so many people who are very often not technical, and that's fine. And so from that standpoint, I think it's just really interesting to, to think about this as like, look, like I feel like we're responsible, and you said the cat's out of the bag, and like I think that's also okay to kind of like feel. As and, a web and, host, and we feel that. responsible for our customer sites. I mean, it'd be nice to say, yeah, you're paying us for this nice apartment, what you want to do in it is your own business, but at the same time, you know, when you rent an apartment, you're asked, do you have an insurance policy? I have to prove my insurance policy every six months to my, to my uh, realtor, which is frustrating and annoying because it doesn't expire for a year, but I have to send it back to them every six months. We don't do that with websites. We tell people, come, give us your money, we'll host your website, we're not gonna check that you know what you're doing, we're not gonna make sure that you have an insurance policy. WordPress is providing a free insurance policy, essentially, and this is something that's needed. We, we've been updating people, we need to continue updating people, and you know the questions that they ask me is we get I get customers saying well WordPress auto updates and you auto update WordPress why don't you auto update my themes and plugins and then there's that whole other mess that I don't want to do yet. <laughs> so we've already talked a little bit about communication, but we, do we want to dig into that a little bit more? We've talked about the need to communicate. We've talked about user expectations. Um, but what would that look like? Uh, what needs to be done in order to get that communication out? I think without going like too deep into this right now because we could get very technical. You don't want to write the code right now? We, okay, let's do that. Um, <laughs> Hackathon. No, I think, that, I think that it's similar to the way Gutenberg was released. You know, there's an update that brings some messaging that says this is coming. Um, it provides people a way to, you know, be part of the process and, you know, <laughs> we could add another button even that says, let's just update right now. You know, we're ready for it right now. Um, and then we could start rolling out those back ports. And then the future, you know, is to be decided what that looks like as far as um, auto updates for major versions in the future. But I think it's it's a it's a messaging process. It's you know it can be admin notices, it can be emails, you know, and we just want to provide a clear uh, method of understanding for how this could be released. And we've already done a lot of work. In the next version of WordPress, it's going to be checking that your admin email is functional. You're asked as you log in, yes, this is still my admin email, we're cool, let's go forward. To ensure that the messages that we've been sending out, like the ones with health check with, hey, there's a problem with your site, we've emailed you what the problem is, let's make sure that email actually worked. And we're making progress every single release. And some of these things can be backported to older versions of WordPress, and maybe that's gonna be the route that we take. But we, are, we do need to make a concerted effort to explain to people what are we doing? Why are we doing this? What does this have to do with the WordPress philosophies? Making things simple, democratizing publishing. But there's a whole lot more than just that. If we're giving people freedoms, shouldn't we also be giving them the tools to enforce their own freedoms and make their own decisions? And yes, we should, and we can do these things. We just have to do them. So let's wrap up by talking a little bit about trust and mitigating risk. Uh, earlier, Mika, you talked about like what could break, um, and we've got a lot of questions uh, online about whether WordPress could be trusted to not break uh, when updating for a major release. Uh, are you worried about this? Oh, yes. Um, my father was a risk analyst. He worked on nuclear power, and uh, when I was a kid, he was on the uh, risk assessment team for what happened to the Challenger explosion. I grew up 
playing risk analysis trees on uh, dining room paper, because I thought that's what everybody did. Uh, <laughs> this explains everything, doesn't it? <laughs> I, 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 my, father's a, my father was a mathematician and a philosopher who studied risk analysis. That was his thing. He wrote a program called Risk Man that is still in use by nuclear power plants today. When I look at the risk of WordPress updating, I don't come to it from a naive place of just saying, well, yeah, of course it's risky. No, I look at it and I say, okay, let's look at the number of plugins and themes we have. Let's look at the number of possible configurations they could have. What are we changing in WordPress? I implicitly trust the minor releases. They are a proven, reliable update. The things that they've broken, we had one release where we didn't even have to have, uh, we, the forums, when I was uh, repping that team, I started making a post called the Oh My God WTF BBQ post, which listed all of the things that people freaked out about. Like, hey, my site doesn't look great, just hit shift refresh, it'll be okay. Uh, caching is being weird, here's what you do. And then here are the plugins and themes that we know are having problems with this minor release. With every release of WordPress, those lists got shorter and shorter and shorter. There was one release 3.8 or 3.9 that we didn't have one at all. I started them in WordPress 3.0 when we did the merge of multi-site in. We still do them to this day. Marius runs them and he's already working on the next one. Because it does help calm people down, but also because we are aware that there are going to be things that get missed. Like I said, the plugin ecosystem is huge. There is, you know, 80,000 plus whatever people are using on the other hosted systems. They're gonna break. And with major releases, I personally have major releases turned on on all of my websites. New version of WordPress comes out, I'm on an airplane, by the time I land it, all of my sites have updated. But I come from a place where I have personally vetted the code in every single plugin and theme I've installed on my sites. I know exactly what's into that, but that is a privilege that I have that not everyone does. And recognizing that tells me that we aren't at a place that we can just blindly say, yes, let's update everybody major releases because we know you haven't updated all your plugins, you haven't updated all your themes. But the good news is that by looking at that on a site, by saying, oh, let's see, this site has no plugins updated in four years, maybe we shouldn't be updating them to the next major release. We can make these judgment calls. So while we may not be able to trust that the upgrade won't break us, we can trust that the upgrade system won't let us be broken. Yeah, and so that's where it gets really interesting. Um, you started the master thread right around the time I started contributing. I'm just curious if that's like correlation and causation. It is not a commentary okay. on your code ability. All right. Um, <laughs> so, uh, like the way the updater works now, uh, people, it's, it's actually really great because there were a few comments online about before this panel where they're like, well, like you're gonna have to like build in rollback solutions. I'm like, ha, we did that six <laughs> years ago. It's already in there. So like, for example, right now, for it to do a minor release auto update, it's doing all sorts of safety checks before it thinks about doing anything, downloads the files it needs, copies over only the exact ones it needs to copy over to limit the number of IO operations, like the disk operations. Um, and then once it does that, uh, it then validates that all those copies were correct, it does some checksum matching and things like that, uh, and then makes sure that the site loads, which is obviously important, but we know it would in this case, of course, uh, and then uh, if for any point anything goes wrong during that like critical period, and that critical period only takes it two or three seconds on most sites, uh, it then downloads the old version of WordPress and copies everything back over again to roll back. And so when you look at the numbers from a minor release standpoint, it's something like 91, 90, or sorry, it's like 99% of, of, of them are just like automatically successful out of the gate. And then in the, like another almost entire full percentage point are like rolled back. And then the remaining ones are like, uh, we might not have fully copied over a file or something like that. And that's where it starts to get a little interesting. But in the, in the like 100 plus million of these that we've done, it's like a few thousand in a corner of like, we think that we might not have fully performed this upgrade. But that happened all the time. And it happens all the time now when people push the button. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's as safe, but then it ends up in like other scenarios where um, uh, like the site is bio, like in most cases still functioning. But beyond that though, that's just what's currently in there. In order to actually do this to the point where like a year or two from now, everything can just be uh, ideally like not 30%, but 100% of WordPress sites just have this by default kind of thing. There's a lot of other things that we could do. 
Uh, so for example, there's been a lot of work in site health and fatal error detection in WordPress that we can easily continue to strengthen, uh, and even like backport to older versions when we want to deal with that. Um, there's also this idea of uh, like how do we deal with plugin compatibility? Well, for example, like WordPress.org uh, knows that this particular plugin already runs on 40 other thousand sites of this particular version of WordPress. And then on 10,000 of those sites, this other plugin is also running. And so there's some interesting heuristics that we can end up doing from a, like a plugin compatibility, like a version matrix perspective, where like rather than back from 10 years ago where we were collecting this data on the plugin page, and you can even still like input that, we can start to think about like what else can we actually surface in terms of knowing like based on the plugins that are on this site, we actually do think it's safe to auto update the site versus based on what we're seeing here, we actually have no idea whether it's safe and we're not going to try doing that. And so this kind of like progressive rollout kind of thing can help us with both the older sites as well as what we want to do going forward. And from a web host perspective, I see the failures. When uh, I get a list of every time we run the updates on DreamPress, I get an actual email that says these are all of the sites that failed. And when we were first starting out with some of this code, that number was actually pretty high. And right now it's down to about it's under 100. And of, of, of millions. Uh, of if I'm just counting DreamPress, it's under 100. If I count all of the sites we have on DreamHost, I don't think it exceeded 500. And that is a crazy number. I don't actually know how many WordPress sites we have anymore because I can't count that high. Um, also, I forgot. Uh, but I can, it's, it's something that's digestible and it will take me three days to go through. And when I look at the sites, the majority of the ones that failed are sites that have been uh, suspended for non-payment which is WordPress tried to update it, it couldn't write files because we disabled being able to write files because they haven't paid us. Those are the problems with upgrades. Upgrades are pretty darn reliable right now. Core upgrades are pretty darn reliable. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think we're ready to turn it over to the audience for questions. Ooh, that was fast. <laughs> That's great, we don't need okay. to like awkwardly wow. wait for Let like just, uh... more and to walk up from the back and come to the mic. And... <laughs> Let me just let everybody know. So we have a mic up here. Uh, please come up in queue if you have questions. If you're not able to come up for any reason, we also have a mic runner who can come to you. We've also got Mary over here who's gonna be fielding some questions from Twitter. We've got about 10 minutes. Um, I'd like to limit questions to one question per person. If you really have that burning second question, get back in the queue. We'll see if we've got time for it. Uh, and please save your uh, comments uh, for blog post comments. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, let's jump in here. Thank and you. please state your name. My name is George. Thank you for the security updates. It's made my life so much better. I am that guy who updated every six months before, and now they just get patched and I don't get hacked, so thank you. Um, I'm also the low man on the totem pole in a very small technical team, and the server admins, uh, when I come to them and I say, guys, auto updates, I'm not gonna patch it. It's gonna be unpatched. If we auto patch it, it's patched. <laughs> They say, okay, that's good, and then I say, I think WordPress needs to own the files. I think the web process needs to have file and folder ownerships. And they look at me and they say, group writable should be okay. And I say, let's try it, and it doesn't work. And, and finally we go, WordPress, or you know, www can own the files. And then they look at me like I'm a bad person. Yeah, so we're, so, um, like, we're talking about a PHP application updating itself. Like it's kind of insane to begin with. Um, and like obviously if you have better deployment processes, you should feel free and like certainly use them and Jake was talking about some of those earlier. Group writable should work. So we, should, we can take a look tomorrow as to why it doesn't. Okay. Um, but you, like you, yeah, so it's one of those things where it's like it's maybe not ideal, but it ends up working especially in a lot of shared host configurations because of the way they're actually doing their security sandboxing. Um, no, that's true. But yeah, so like it's totally and like if you have a sysadmin then you are already in like the 0.1% of WordPress sites, so like, whatever they wanna do, you should just listen to them, is like my general take. But yeah, I'm glad you're able to like use it and it works for you. Hello. So, the reason why Internet Explorer 6 still exists <laughs> is because um, airline booking systems, hotel booking systems, banks, and a bunch of other solutions run on mission critical software that doesn't run in anything else. Um, when Windows force update, updated sites, there was a genuine risk of taking down like the international banking system. And very, very bad things started happening and they ended up not having to do it. WordPress is mission critical software. 
Um, there are many solutions out in the wild that have to run older versions of WordPress for various reasons. Now, I'm all for auto-updating, and I believe in it. However, the reason why there's this legal issue that we still don't have lawyers talking about because WordPress doesn't have lawyers representing WordPress is about the older sites that run mission-critical software where if something happens, the people at the end of those sites need to know who they can go to and say, hey, who made this decision? So I actually have a good experience for you here, Morton. I worked for a bank for 16 years, give or take. I am not only well aware with the bizarre implications of why you must use older software at banks, your ATMs were using Windows 95 until not that long ago, but what is required to do those things? And when we talked about enterprises not updating, that is literally the situation that, we are, that they are facing. They won't update if they don't know it's safe and true and they haven't tested it. And if you have a bank or an airline or a financial institution or a car dealership that isn't doing that, there is nothing in the world that we could do to alleviate their, alleviate their concerns because they haven't done what is legally required of them in the first place. Now that said, is there a legal contact for WordPress if, my, if WordPress destroys my site? No, there's not. There hasn't been. There's never been. It's open source, it's GPL, it's free for people to use, and they accepted those risks when they installed that software originally. If we're talking about large organizations, they have the lawyers already. We were not legally allowed to use shareware or freeware when I worked at the bank. Yes, that made Unix really weird. But these are things that they have already taken care of. Now, if we extrapolate that and go step back and say, okay, what about the smaller companies? What about, you know, uh, the 10-man WordPress company out there that doesn't have those lawyers, that hasn't done that prep work? These are risks that you as a company understand when you start things. And there are going to be mistakes that are made. But what happens today if I update uh, Toast SEO, it's not a real plugin, and it breaks my site. <laughs> who do I contact? Who, who do I talk to? As a web host today, I am aware of how difficult that is because they come to me and say, hey, we host on your site. You said we should use WordPress. You recommended we use this toasty SEO and it broke my site. Now what? Who is legally responsible then? And what it comes down to is by accepting those things, you should have already done that prep work. And I know that that sounds like I'm throwing people under the bus, and I'm not. But what I'm saying is that from a legal aspect, as a large company, if you haven't already answered that, you have a lawyer in the back of your office tearing their hair out. And if I can add just one small sure. practical piece, those mission critical WordPress sites, either they already are using minor release updates, in which case I'm like, okay, if you wanna do that, but they, they should have all of this turned off just based on their deployment processes. Like not even that they have turned it off, like WordPress has already detected like, hey, I can't write these files because that would make sense, or hey, you're already using a, a version control, so that would make sense. Um, like what you were talking about earlier. From when you're, when you're in that mission critical space, like if WordPress, you're in the enterprise, you're not gonna get an auto update. Like you're not gonna be automatically updated for the security update. I know I challenged you for a question. No. I wanna make sure we get to the other ones Yeah, too. I know, but just so you understand, mission critical is mom and pop store, shops. And I get that. Enterprise. Mission critical is like my bike park website that I host. Well, so like I look forward to that being auto updated, so, so I don't have to deal yeah. with it. Let me just say also like, I don't want to break sites. Nathan. None of us want to break sites. Like, we want to make sure that what we're doing is safe. Like, yeah, there's an, there's like, I think there's a good, I think it's a good point to talk about legal risk and things like that and like the, like the risk factor. But it's also like, I remember during three, the 3.7 three, three development, everyone was like, you're gonna break the world. And I was like, trust me, if I break the world, I'm like resigning. Like, no, I don't, I don't wanna break the world. Nason and I had a lot of conversations because I was like, you're going to break the world if we don't do this right. <laughs> Yeah. And, and I still think that today, with the idea of major updates, we have a risk of breaking the world if we don't do it right. But we are going to be doing it right. We've been taking each step methodically, safely, securely, smartly, to do these things the right way. Yeah, just let's, round. let's move on to the next question. We don't have a lot hey, of time. Uh, thanks for the conversation. So I love the idea of thinking about WordPress like Chrome, and it automatically updates the latest version. But I wonder if we're not a little bit more like Ubuntu, 
where uh, we're like an operating system, and the way we get our users to upgrade is we end support for old versions. The reason I upgrade my Ubuntu <laughs> servers is because I know that the security updates will no longer be released. Um, so my question is really, has that, has that been thought about? Is there any consideration for the model of updates and what, I, what that would mean? Yeah, I, I don't think we want to be in a place where we have like long-term supports or I, that has been tried in WordPress core before and it didn't work out very well. I think we just want to be in a place where we, you know, we get everybody on one version of WordPress and that's a version of WordPress that we support. Um, I don't think that, and, and auto updates is a major part of that. When you're not worried, like I'm not worried about when I type in gmail.com, I'm not worried about what version of Gmail I get. I know it's gonna be whatever's the most recent and I think that auto updates kind of paved the way for that. One other thing that I'll add to that is also just like, we support the latest version of WordPress. That's actually it. We also, out of the kindness of our hearts and the deep <laughs> responsibility we share, use the ability to push a security release to a 3.7 site to this day. Because I did it two weeks ago and it was terrifying. Yeah, because it's like still like 40,000 sites and like if I can just, if it just takes a little bit of work on our end to be able to secure all of those sites, like it's just totally worth it. Like it's completely worth it. But like though that release package doesn't actually get otherwise shown to the user. It's not listed on WordPress.org. It's not like it's not official release in any regard, except for from an auto update perspective. Only need to be able to like kind of hot fix these older sites. So that's one of the reasons why we want to obviously drop that down. We never wanted it to go six years like this. But yeah, I mean like we only support the latest version of WordPress. It's always been that way. But we're also like, if I have the ability to protect that very long tail of sites of people who have no idea how to use Ubuntu. I, I want to. Like, I just, there's, there's a certain responsibility there. And I can promise you as a web host, telling a customer that EOL has happened does not matter. Uh, when we upgraded people from 5.4 PHP, there were screams. 5.2 PHP was a nightmare because we tell people, Look, it's end of life, it doesn't get security, it doesn't get anything, we have to update your site. And they did not want to go. So from a customer standpoint, from, a, from an educated technical standpoint, so the, the three of us sitting up here, yeah, we get that. But from an end user standpoint, no. EOL means nothing to them. I think we've got time for one more. Yeah? All right. Oh, maybe two. Hi, so you talked a lot about the risks of auto updating. Um, are there any risks of maintaining the status quo uh, indefinitely? Yes. Yes. <laughs> what are they? Yes. <laughs> Only one question per person, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. I appreciate it. Um, I am curious about for new sites, if there's any plans to do things to make sure that people are educated about the risks of, you know, maybe installing auto updates that possibly could break your site, or um, if you do enable uh, or don't enable auto updates, what other options are available to you to make sure your site's secure, like cloud-based firewalls and that sort of thing? So there's an interesting thing that I watch it as working at a web host is uh, I'm going to say well over 80% of our new customers who are installing WordPress for the first time never see the install process. They tell me, we want WordPress. I have personally written the code that they say that, cool. It gets automatically installed, set up, configured. They get an email that says, great, your WordPress site is up. Here's how you log in. They don't see that anymore. We have, as a web host, the ability to contact them and give them this information. Putting it in WordPress, if you've logged into WordPress for the first time and you get that welcome box, nobody reads it. There's a point at which you have to accept that nobody reads any of those things up there. And, be, and if they did, I wouldn't get half the tickets that we get for first time users. And that's not to say we're doing something wrong, it's just a fundamental part of human nature. There should be a better way to teach them of, hey, your WordPress site is going to auto update. With the majority of web hosts today, when you say I want WordPress and you press a button to install it, they tell you right then and there, we will be auto updating your WordPress site. Um, if you are a self-starter who has downloaded it and read the five-minute install and you're gonna install your own SQL database and press all this button yourselves, yeah, we should have something along those lines that says, hey, this is gonna happen. You should know that, that we've got auto updates. Um, but those are things that we can change in the, in the magical five-minute install that is now like two minutes. It's, I mean, it's one click on most of these. No, shows. it's got three, because you gotta pick a language. Oh, there you go. Um, the other, I think the other piece that I'll talk about there is like, from a philosophical standpoint, the way WordPress approaches its software development is about like, how do we make sure that things work out of the box for the vast majority of our users? And we also want to make sure that we're not burdening users 
with like our technical decisions and like things that they just don't need to understand. Now, like if you were running like Ubuntu, I think like the technical knowledge of someone running that is going to be a lot different than like the vast majority of WordPress users. And like that's for the most part, like most of us here are likely like far more technical than like the average WordPress user. And so what that ends up looking like is like if we end up burdening them with so much information, I actually don't even like how much information we're giving them right now about like their PHP version because no one knows what the hell that is and like all these other things that like I actually am worried already about how much information we're giving them. And so it's like this very careful give and take of like we want to communicate to them what all this means. But as like nicely as possible and in such a way where we're not like burdening them with something that should really be our responsibility as much as possible. So it's like a really interesting balance there. Well, we do say decisions, not options. Yeah. And if we can decide do the, if they don't care about their PHP version, which they shouldn't, you shouldn't have to care about your PHP version. Let your web host sweat about that. We're made for that. You shouldn't have to care about your SQL version. But if we can take those things away and not have to have people worry about those and just start in with, hey, cool, you've installed WordPress. Welcome to our wild world. We've got thousands of plugins. We've got hundreds of themes. And we're going to take care of updates for you. Have a great day. I'd feel pretty good that sounds if like I was starting really with nice that. Ending. Doesn't that sound nice? Have a great day. <laughs> Mika, Jake, Nason, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay. Yeah, sure. How about it? Very much. Just pull yours up. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to day two of WordCamp US 2019. We're excited to be here in St. Louis. My name is David. I'll be your host this morning until 11.15. Uh, before we start, I just want to go over a few announcements. Please silence all your cell phones and any other electronic devices that you have. Uh, please move towards the center if you can so that other folks can easily enter the room and find seats. Um, please see, leave the seats closest to the screens available for anyone with accessibility needs. If anyone has any additional accessibility needs that we can assist you with, uh, please, uh, oops, <laughs> sorry, I lost. Uh, please go to our room manager who's uh, walking back over there. And there will be a Q&A session um, at the end of the presentation. I'll be running around with a mic, so if you have any questions at the end, uh, please raise your hand and please hold them until the end. And if you wish to speak with the presenter at length afterwards, please ask if they would be minimal to meeting later in the speaker hall or um, at the support desk. And we want to encourage everyone to come to Contributor Day on Sunday. If you've never been to Contributor Day and you want to know what it's all about, uh, please visit the Get Involved table down in the sponsor hall. Our presenter is Cat White. Cat White is a uh, full stack LAMP web developer who's been building websites since 1999. She worked in WordPress since 2003, Drupal since 2007, and has worked with numerous other content management systems over the years. As CTO of Canopy Studios, she works to keep Canopy excellent in all things technical. She's a solutions architect for clients ranging from small businesses and high growth startups to global Fortune 500 companies. She loves helping clients see the relationship between their business goals and their technical solutions and maximizing the impact and longevity of their sites within the constraints of their projects. She is also a passionate advocate for accessibility, rewarding user experiences, and future-proof development methodologies. Cat also travels, knits hats, and binge reads books. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh oh, hang on one sec. I gotta get my uh, visuals back over here. All right, excellent. All right, well, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Kat. I am the CTO of Canopy Studios, and we're gonna talk today about tracking <laughs> and analytics tools and how to use them uh, responsibly as owners of websites. So let's get going. Um, as you mentioned, uh, Canopy, we are a full service, um, website digital agency. We take care of the full life cycle of open source websites for our clients, working in everything from kind of ongoing continuous improvements to sites, uh, as well as full scale rebuilds and redesigns. So it's a lot of fun. I get to see projects in a lot of different stages. And um, in kind of all of these sorts of engagements, a uh, big part of what we do is discovery um, and looking at the way users are using sites currently. And it's the analytics tools that enable us to do that. Uh, to put this in some context, I wanted to talk about, um, it is very seasonal, I know, so I have, I have a spooky house up here. Uh, there's this cooperative board game that I play with my family, it's called Mysterium, uh, where you are a group of internationally renowned psychics in the 1920s, and you're trying to help lay this ghost to rest who was murdered in this super creepy house. Uh, the objective of the game is to derive kind of what the ghost wants to tell you about, it's clue-like, kind of the, the where, the who, and the what, right, um, through pictures that it shares with you. Uh, so on its own, right, it's just that. It's a board game. Uh, it's one I highly recommend if you've never played it. It's a lot of fun. Uh, but you can also set this up to use atmospheric music and low lighting. And we have a ghost in our family who likes to knock once for yes and twice for no when answering questions. So it feels different, because it is different. You're using the same game in kind of a spooky, creepy way. You can ask my 10-year-old daughter about this, because I have actually been banned now from playing this game with her. Um, <laughs> in anything less than full daylight, we have to have like Shawn Mendes pop music on the stereo, uh, and I have to be the most talkative ghost you have ever met. Um, and online tracking can actually be a lot like this. Uh, these things are tools, uh, and they can make the experience of your website better for a lot of people. But if you use them in an opaque way or an invasive way without enough uh, transparency and communication, 
they can have a really high creep factor that people don't want any part of. So today we're gonna look at how users as a whole feel about the state of privacy versus personalization on the web, as well as looking at some of these tools and how to make sure that you're using them in the least creepy way possible. So let's talk a little bit about what users want. Let's talk about what today's context of digital interaction looks like and what the expectations are that are out there in the market. Um, many of these statistics come from a fantastic study that WP Engine actually sponsored that they did with the Center for Generational Kinetics. And I got super excited when I read it, so I'm gonna share some of the highlights that I pulled out that um, really spoke to me in the, in the context of tracking and analytics, and I do uh, recommend that you check it out as well if you haven't read through it. 37% um, of users expect a user-centric experience on your site. So they think that websites are going to recognize and adapt to them and create an optimized experience that is tailored to them within the next five years. Along the same lines, the concept of a universal ID in users' minds is now a very real one. So this idea that within five years, at every level, uh, a person will have an online footprint that is known across the web and is used to tailor sites to your unique needs and preferences. Because we so, know so much about them, therefore, 50% of these respondents expect you to know what they need before they do. They want that five-star experience. Uh, in this particular um, segment, we're talking about Gen Z, which is also known as iGen and a couple of other uh, names out there. Uh, but just to define it, we're talking about young people who were born in 1996 or later. So this is the up and coming folks who are going to really transform the way that we communicate our message and interact with our audiences online. And they are looking for this predictive experience on the web. What's also interesting, though, is of total respondents to this study, 62% of them want anonymity. They would prefer to have to select all of their options, all of their choices manually, if it meant they were completely anonymous. Uh, different groups of users have different expectations of privacy, but it's important to everyone. And I find it really, really interesting, interesting this, this dichotomy between what users expect and what they want. So what do they think is actually going to happen in five years versus deep down what they'd really, where they'd really like to be? So why is that? Why is anonymity so important to over half the respondents in this study um, when we also feel like these predictive experiences, these personalized experiences are coming? What is it that the users fear? What is the context of this digital interaction? Well, we've all gotten burnt. <laughs> About 64% uh, of people, this is a study done also in 2017 by the Pew Research Center, 64% of Americans have experienced a major data breach. Um, and so when it comes to ensuring that experiences are safe, it's a huge concern for everyone. Um, two of the top three least liked aspects of the web overall have this relationship with people's online security. Um, 49%, regardless of whether they've actually experienced a problem or not, they feel vulnerable. They feel like their personal information isn't as secure as it was five years ago. The fact that everybody's got this universal access to their information, but they don't feel like they know where it is at any given point in time and who has it, right? And they consistently lack confidence in the security of their communications, the tools that they use online. And that lack of confidence as site owners who are genuinely trying to get out there and help, um, it, it puts up a barrier in our relationship. So it's important to remember that security and privacy are different. People are starting to make the transition where they understand that they have to give up some level of personal information to receive a personalized experience but that shouldn't compromise their security. So we're talking about privacy here in this context. Um, and this young generation, these Gen Z folks, uh, they are the ones that are really going to push that forward. The mindset around security from defensive to growth and the idea that we're going to have to give something to get something. So that transparency of that relationship is incredibly important and is a big part of what we're going to talk about as we go through these tools. 
So how do we then um, give these users what they want while respecting what they need? Uh, one classic approach to getting user feedback on your website is just to ask them, right? So we pop up surveys, we make active requests for feedback, and these are fantastic and proactive sources of information. They're really great. But they get in the way of what the user actually came to your website to do. Uh, which ironically kind of flies in the face of good UX, which is the thing that we're trying to improve, right? By looking at all of this data. Uh, it's all about reducing those barriers and making it easy for them to accomplish goals. So how can we find out what they came here to do and reduce the friction that's caused by our quest for information? What passive observation techniques can we use to learn more about users without getting in their way? So what we're going to talk about here is tools and tactics, data, inputs that we use at our agency as a part of info gathering when we work with clients on website redesigns or growth plans, and how we implement and derive those insights on WordPress sites. Um, so there are typically many focused fixes or changes that you can make immediately based on some of this information without starting over. So it's a great area to kind of incrementally improve things by leveraging your analytics data. So let's dive in. For purposes of our talk today, I have split this very scientifically into uh, the not Googles and the Googles uh, in terms of our tools. So I'm curious, who out here is using Google Analytics as your tool of choice? OK. Who's not using analytics platforms at all? OK. That's about what I figured. Uh, Google is really pervasive. It's a fantastic tool. It's free to use. So we're going to do a deep dive into some of the more advanced features of Google Analytics that you may or may not be aware of. But there are some more specialized tools and information sources that are not Google-based that are worth talking about first. So let's dive into the not Googles. Uh, one big thing I want to bring up is site search logging. Oddly enough, this is actually one of the most powerful sources of information we've found when it comes to finding out what your users are looking for. By logging people's search queries when they come to your website, and they type it in your search box what they're looking for, you get a crystal clear picture of highly searched content. You can start to think about ways to get your users to that content faster. You can promote popular content. You can create content calendars based on, like if you've got a lot of queries that are thematic, that's clearly an area that's of interest to your audience right now. So how can you bubble that up? Uh, it also gives you um, the ability to see what might be just, just buried, information you think is easy to find on your site that's critical part of your user's journey, but that they can't get to it. So it's a fantastic tool that's really simple to implement. You're also going to see here I have created another um, highly scientific structure called my creepometer, meter, um, which is just a categorization technique, very rough, that I'm going to use throughout the talk to give you a high-level idea of how deeply personal we're getting with any of these individual tactics uh, and how creepy it might seem to your users. So therefore, how important it is that you ask, not tell, but ask permission uh, before you use these. A little bit more about site search. Um, beyond user feedback, it's actually huge. And since WordPress gives it to you out of the box, if you're not using it on your site, highly recommend just turning it on. Um, you may not think you have enough blog posts or targeted content to merit it, uh, but if there's any depth to your site, you might as well. Um, the potential benefits are enormous. Interestingly, Forrester shows that 43% of people will use search first when they come to your site. So it's a great way to know exactly what, and when they come in, they know exactly what they want. So they actually convert better because they've landed on your site, they go to search, and they're looking for something specific. Um, and generally speaking, from just a, a conversion standpoint, they're going to engage more deeply with your brand. They're going to convert at higher level of revenue or are more likely to close, and just depending on kind of what your pipeline looks like for um, connecting with your users. In terms of doing this, um, I like to give Relevancy a plug here uh, because it's an excellent search plugin for WordPress. If you're not using it, highly, highly recommend it. Um, it has a setting that will uh, log search queries in the WordPress database. Now, that does get bloated, so it's something that I recommend that you clean out on a semi-regular basis, but uh, it'll do that heavy lifting for you, and it also gives you very relevancy-based search results that are excellent. So if this is something you're not using currently, I love it. 
Uh, and you know, again, this ranks pretty low on the creep meter because you're able to do this without leveraging any third-party tools beyond just WordPress. Since this point is a little more topical than tool-based, I am going to dabble in my Googles here um, for a couple of these. Uh, I wanted to mention this particular feature before I really dive into those tools, because site search logging is also something that you can do um, within analytics. Uh, this is under your view settings. You can turn it on, and since WordPress typically just passes that queue in the URL with the search term, it's really easy to configure this for WordPress sites, and you can just do it within analytics without messing with anything else if you want to. Contact form analysis. So this is another one that's native to your site um, that you may not have thought about in the context of analytics and data gathering on your users. But what we have found is that it's a great tool because it's you and only you, and it's a direct conversation with your users. Um, you might be a little surprised at how high I rank this on the creepo meter, but that's because you know exactly who this feedback came from. Like, there is nothing anonymous about this. They have a, you know, they have a reply to email. Um, but in aggregate, these kinds of communications can point to significant trends on your site. If there's something, again, that nobody can find, or FAQs that you're consistently answering. Um, or even if it's an outlier, but it's a point of view that maybe you don't hear very often from a user with a particular challenge or a particular perspective. Um, it's incredibly value and can lead to, valuable and can lead to really significant gains uh, in terms of understanding your users and their needs. Um, the one thing I will say about this is, you know, I did mention it's usually tied to personally identifying information, or PII. Um, so just make sure that you don't keep this stuff hanging around in your database any longer than you have to. Visual behavior analytics is another area that we look at. Um, this lets you see users interacting with your site. It's really, really cool. Um, the primary tool here is heat mapping, which basically tells you what's hot and what's not from purposes of your page. Uh, you will see where people spend the most time interacting with your content, which you know, typically, like for example, top left, your logo area is going to be bright, bright red, and you will have like nobody three quarters of the way down to your page scroll. Um, but uh, so that's, that's, so that's kind of what it is at, at a high level. And there's also a session recording aspect of this where if you can't do actual user testing where you look over somebody's shoulder, and again, that's kind of an unnatural experience for them, um, you can use session recordings through these visual behavior analytics tools to uh, watch them use your site. I mean, they'll actually do a recording. You'll see their pointer go around. You'll see where they hover and pause, where they don't, what they actually click on, where they go to next what they do there. It's incredibly powerful if you don't have the opportunity to kind of sit down with your users on a regular basis. The one that I use most frequently is Hotjar. Um, this is what we use to do our visualization analytics. Crazy Egg is another one of these tools that's really, really well known. I don't have a lot of uh, depth of experience with it, so I, I won't vouch for it from a privacy perspective. Um, but I am going to actually talk a little bit about what's, what's a little bit creepy or not creepy about Hotjar. Um, it gives you both those uh, heat mapping visualizations. It gives you the session recordings. Um, I'm not covering some of the other features of the tool in this talk, because um, we don't use them as frequently for varying reasons. Um, I went through their terms of service, their privacy policy, so y'all wouldn't have to. Found some pretty cool things that I thought I would share. Um, they suppress all the keystrokes. They are GDPR compliant. Uh, users can go to the you can also facilitate this, but users can go to Hotjar's site. They can opt out of Hotjar running for them on any site, um, which is really nice, because they can do it once and forget about it. Um, and they don't keep their data for more than a year, which I really like. So I wanted to show some examples. These are heat maps. So when we talk about you know, those, those hot areas on your site, what are people looking at? Uh, it provides a visual guide to the clicks and the movement and the scrolling. Um, so there are three different kinds of heat maps that you can get to using these tools. And this is what a session recording will look like. So looking at the activity of an individual user, you can see exactly where they went, where they didn't click, where they stopped, um, and get a good idea of how they're digesting the contents on your site. Um, Hotjar does have a free plan, so if you're at all curious about it, uh, it's something you can experiment with without committing. 
Um, in terms of integration with your WordPress site, so how do you use these things? That's neat and all. Um, like many things, Hotjar has an official WordPress plugin uh, that you can just plug in, add your ID, and be done. Uh, if you prefer to do it on a vendor, uh, on a you know tool by tool basis. Um, Again, just from a subject matter perspective, it's worth mentioning Google Tag Manager here because Hotjar is actually one of their built-in tag types um, that's available, and so you can also set this up through Tag Manager if you're using that. Um, it's a nice approach because it gives you a lot of granularity in terms of where you run things um, or conditions under which you run things. So if you are doing like GDPR compliance, for example, you can get much more granular with which trackers run and which don't if you're inside Tag Manager. Um, and again, this is the not Google section, but um, this is actually my strongly preferred way to manage multiple tags and beacons is through a Tag Manager, um, having spent one too many years trying to chain callbacks on tracking analytics. Um, so that's that one. I would be remiss not to mention in the not Google section that there are some incredibly robust other analytics platforms out there. And depending on how you feel about using Google tools or whether your organization doesn't let you use them, um, Matomo is one I've heard a ton about. If you use it, I'd love to chat with you after this because I actually haven't had the opportunity to dive into it for a client. Um, so I, I don't have a lot of firsthand experience with these, but. Um, I'd be remiss not to mention them. There's a lot of great tools out there that are not GA um, that you can look at in terms of gathering analytics data on your own servers or on a different platform. So with that, now we will talk about the Googles. Google tools, so cool. They're free. Uh, they're incredibly powerful. You can get tons of insights. You can integrate your data sources using like Data Studio. They've got an incredibly broad reach. So when you look at benchmarking things in Google tools, you're pulling from a huge um, cross-section of people in your industry or your area. Problem is nothing is actually free. So uh, Google, in their terms of service, um, actually states that they can use their content for all their, your content for their existing and future services. If you do stuff on Google, in theory, they can use it in places you may not be aware of. Um, obviously, Google tools track you on other websites. They may also use device fingerprinting, uh, which is a way of saying um, they can recognize your unique phone or computer based on the configuration of it. So even if you are a person that blocks trackers, based on your kind of unique profile of how you've got Chrome set up, it can be really interesting to go and see that if you're running JavaScript, they can basically still figure out who you are, not to make everybody paranoid. Um, have to do a hat tip here um, to the site TOSDR, which stands for Terms of Service Didn't Read. <laughs> um, it gives great high-level analysis of this stuff for common trackers, so if you're using like Twitter things, or Facebook things, or Google things, they're all out there. Um, and my information on kind of the creepy stuff for Google uh, came from them. Um, there is a link in these slides, which I'll also be posting to Twitter after this talk. Um, it is an open source project, so if trackers you use are not out there on TOSDR, I know they would love to have your support, um, and you can help make it easier for others. But that's, that's the source of this information. So Tag Manager. Um, how many folks out there are already using Tag Manager if you're using analytics? Okay, not as many. It's fantastic, no lie. Uh, it's a container, it's gonna help you manage a whole bunch of tags in one place. It's deeply, deeply integrated with Google Analytics. Some, some of the advanced features we're gonna talk about with GA um, are much easier to implement via Tag Manager than they are via analytics directly. Um, and there are a lot of tracking tools like Hotjar that have these out of the box configurations, and you don't have to be as developer heavy to leverage the platform. Um, one of the things I've been doing a lot of in Tag Manager lately that I really, really like is this um, ability to strategically set up all the sub tags in your Tag Manager so that they only fire based on user consent given. So I can then start grouping tags into types, and I can give users the opportunity to opt out of certain types of tracking, and I can make sure those are turned off based on their preferences um, without having to do anything crazy in code. 
Google Tag Manager for WordPress is my favorite tool for doing this implementation easily. Uh, it also makes it, one of the things I love about it, the reason I really love it, is it makes it very straightforward to write a bunch of helpful information to the data layer that you can use in conjunction with other features of GA. So the data layer is kind of the key to getting customized information into analytics. So you can see here, for example, in the screenshot, um, it gives you the ability to include author information or category information or things that you might then in analytics want to turn around and say, well, who are my most popular authors? What is about their style that's resonating for people? Using the data layer um, with GA can give you those kinds of insights. Uh, Search Console is another one I love to bring up. If you're not using Search Console and you are using analytics, this is really, really easy to turn on. Um, you do it under your property settings or from your acquisition menu. But um, <laughs> we've all seen this probably at some point. The not provided keywords that make up like 90% of your search traffic. The way you get to that information is through Search Console. Uh, Search Console will actually have the breakdown of what's in that area. If I understand it all correctly, this is because searches that are run over a secure connection don't show up here, but they will show up in console. Um, so once you have that integrated with your analytics, you have the ability to access that data from within analytics, which is really handy. Campaign tracking is another one that depending on how you interact with users, this can be a great source of information about different types of users, where they come from, and what they like to do on your site. So for example, if you're running specific campaigns, ad campaigns, or content campaigns in Facebook, uh, and you're also sending some of those links out in your email newsletters, you can see whether the people coming from Facebook uh, resonate with that better than the people that are coming from email, for example. Uh, and campaign tracking lets you do that. Again, there's links at the end of the deck to this um, uh, campaign URL builder, which will help you get all the parameters right in terms of building those URLs that you can then plug into your ads or your email newsletters or whatever it is that you want to track. Um, but this will let you segment by the campaign itself. So if you've got a seasonal thing that you're running or what have you, um, the source of your traffic, so was it your newsletter um, or was it Facebook, and then um, the medium, which is typically going to be, you know, uh, like your, you, whether it was like an email thing or a banner ad or what have you. Okay, so custom dimensions. This is what I was referring to when I talked about the data layer. And custom dimensions are something that I know a lot of people haven't messed with, so they're worth talking about. This is getting a little higher on the creepometer. meter. <laughs> because now what we're doing is we're looking at customized information about an analytics hit. Um, the data has to be populated on the data layer via external means, like WordPress, so by using like the Tag Manager plugin. Um, and you can then take that piece of data and you can assign it a scope. You can say this is a hit scope, a user scope, or a session scope. So a hit scope would be on this page, I want to record this information, right? A user scope would be, now that I've cookied this user, every time this user does something, this piece of data shows up. And your session scope would be, while they're on the site this time, I want to keep track of this piece of information. Um, and then when you run custom reports in analytics, you can actually use this information as a primary dimension for filtering those reports. Demographics data. <laughs> now we're getting really creepy. You can turn this on. It's a checkbox. Um, it can help you identify high value segments of your audience. Um, you cannot use it in conjunction with user ID tracking, which I'll cover in just a minute. Um, this also does integrate with AdWords. The important thing to know about user demographic tracking is it does require updates to your privacy policy if you choose to turn it on. Some folks are able to use it, some folks are not. But what this is going to do is it's going to look at average age of your audience, average, you know, what, the breakdown of gender for your audience. Um, it'll tell you things like what are they in the market for right now? if that information is available, like in terms of types of products or types of services. It'll tell you what are their interests. Um, so really powerful, getting a little creepy, but you can then use it to do levels of audience segmentation. 
um, so crafting these market segments that you can then run reports against. User ID integration, um, this is pretty much my highest thing on the Creepa meter. It is really cool. I have started implementing it for some clients specifically who are doing tracking around like membership models and like what members like to uh, work with um, or different types of members, different levels of members, what have you, from a content perspective. The big things to know, it cannot contain any personally identifying information and must be a random identifier. Um, that said, you can use typically user IDs that are tied to your CMS platform do qualify. I verified that. Um, there are obviously a lot of wrong and creepy ways to handle this one. So, considerations. So this is my mini rant. I'll try to keep it uh, to a minimum for you. But how creepy are you? Um, you need to know the regulations that apply to your business and be transparent about the trackers that you're using. Make it accessible for people to understand what you're doing. Um, only keep the stuff as long as you need it. Um, and again, I highly encourage looking at ways to configure your trackers to allow people to, to opt out at a more granular level. The whole, by using my site, you agree to everything I want to do is kind of not a lovely thing to do to people. Um, and actually isn't compliant with some things uh, in terms of privacy regulations. Um, so you got, and you also got to make it as easy for them to get out as it is for them to get in. Because if on Tuesday they feel like being attracted and on Wednesday they don't, we've got to respect that. Um, another one is accessibility of your trackers. So this is something we've run into. I actually was working with a client. We tried to run a pop-up survey and it turned out that pop-up survey, um, they had a big focus on blind users. And with keyboard navigation, they couldn't close it. They couldn't get around it. They couldn't actually access the page content. It's a nightmare. Um, so testing with screen readers, testing with assistive navigation, um, testing with your tracking blockers enabled. So for people that like to do it at that global level, um, your site functionality shouldn't be affected by that. So these things need to be implemented on your site in non-blocking ways. Um, and consider the performance. You might be shocked at, um, I go, sometimes I'll pull together a laundry list of all the trackers that are running on a site. People have no idea that this stuff is even on there, and they have no idea why. It's kind of terrifying. So only track what you need for as long as you need it. Um, <laughs> I, this is my, one of my rants, um, but to this exact point, uh, there is a certain house for a certain mouse. Uh, that is a recent personal example of the pain um, of not planning for these preferences, because as you might expect from this talk, I am a online privacy nut, and I use VPNs and secure browsers, and I come with my own hotspot, and I'm, I'm that person. Uh, and I block every tracker in creation. Um, and I am actually taking my family here in March, and we're doing like a big trip. So he was like, I have to add all these people so that I can make all these reservations and like do all these things. Turns out um, you can't do that if you block trackers. It doesn't work. I can't actually click the add a person to my planning party button and have it go anywhere. Um, so I'm fundamentally blocked from using the tool <laughs> by choosing not to be tracked. Uh, now, obviously, I grumbled, looked at the console, turned things on, did what I had to do to make it run, but the question is, should I have to do that? Um, so, you know, this is that awareness component. What are you using on your site today? Do you know what all is out there? Um, do you understand what their privacy and data retention practices are? Because that will, in turn, affect you. So knowing your widgets. Um, Tools like this can lead to these inception-like scenarios, too. So make sure you know what your partners, what your tools are doing behind the scenes uh, when they're included on your site. I was recently debugging an analytics implementation, and I asked a bunch of folks to jump on it so I could kind of see on the real-time dashboard what was happening. And one of my devs came to me and was like, wait, we're running two ID codes. And I'm like, oh, no, we're not. You see that widget in the footer? It's running its own tracking. That's what you're seeing. So, you know, ask me how I feel about widgets. <laughs> but, um, uh, and now you all know how I feel about it, but because we are here. So, you know, in closing, I wanted to say that, you know, you are just as creepy as your partners. So we can look at the creepy factor. We can say, we're not creepy, but if the tools we use are creepy, then we have a problem. So not all these tools are created equal. These widgets and things we include on our site can be a window into somebody else's ethics, and few things are truly free. So while these tools are incredibly powerful, just make sure you're using them responsibly. Use that data to make users' worlds better, but make sure that you're sharing the information with them on what you're doing and why. Uh, in the immortal words of Reading Rainbow, don't take my word for it, um, 
references and resources. So a lot of the research that I cite or the tools that I've uh, mentioned are listed here. And again, I'll be posting these slides um, up on Twitter after the, after the session today. Thank you. Oh, you want me to go back? Got it? All right. So there's my Twitter handle. I love to talk about this stuff. Please reach out. Um, I'm happy to connect uh, after this. Or if you've got questions, we can talk about them now. OK, we have 10 minutes for questions. Uh, Signal, if you have a question, I'll bring you the mic. That's actually the incorrect slide URL. Um, so I will update that in the deck and uh, put out an updated one on Twitter. So close enough, there we go. So you mentioned giving users like an ability to sort of like granularly like, opt out of things. Um, I personally myself just like have my VPN on like JavaScript up unless I need it. I'm like, I hate like, like 90 pop-ups asking me different things throughout my experience. I do get the idea of like, yes, I'd much rather give, have gradual control of it, but like how do you hit the balance between like your user not having to hit a new button, like a new opt in or out on every page load? Like how do you handle that granular control that you mentioned? I'm getting a lot of reverb on the question. Can is you try this, maybe repeating better? it with the mic closer? Hello. Okay. Perfect, so thank you. How do you hit the balance between not having to constantly basically having a a click through conversation with the user about what they do agree to or not, and actually giving them the ability to have that granular control over their privacy. That is not just like yes to everything or no opt out of the website. Right. Um, there's a tool, and I, I can validate myself here. Um, OneTrust is a cookie management tool that's GDPR compliant that actually gives you the ability to like, you, you click on manage my settings, and it's like, so it's a pop up banner like you're used to. You click on manage my settings, and then you can check or uncheck checkboxes for certain categories of tracking. Um, and I really like that approach because they do. They do it once and they forget about it. Um, and then on the tag manager side, which is typically where I'm doing it, I can look at which checkboxes they said yes to and no. Um, and I also recommend keeping track of that consent, like store that in your platform that they gave it. Um, then I can turn things off or on. Okay, awesome. Any other questions? Excuse me. I had a client ask about um, like a B2B lead identification tool, and I know there are some out there. Is, are those ethical in your opinion, and have you worked with any of those? So getting kind of into the big data scenario. Um, I don't love them. I haven't worked with them directly, so um, I don't have personal insights on the subject. From, a, from an ethics perspective, I just tend to think if, if, if people know they're opting in to being a part of that kind of, that kind of big data model, that kind of platform, fine, great. You know, they're, they, they, if they've expressly put their information out there, um, I'm fine with it. I guess what I worry about are some of these things that are like, I just don't, I don't know. I don't know that people know how far their data really goes into those kinds of systems. So I don't love them, but I understand, certainly understand why they're there. Um, and I guess B2B for me, I feel a little bit differently about it in some ways than I do B2C. Whether I should or not is another, another point. Yeah, way in the back. <laughs> oh, thank you. Hi, um, could you speak about uh, like crafting a privacy policy? Um, a super common thing for us is like, we install Google Analytics, that's like it. And I have no idea really what we're collecting, and I know that they're not doing anything with it, but like we want to be proactive with this, so like how do we go about doing this? So typically, one of the nice things about GA, if you're just running vanilla GA, uh, all you really have to have, and I should caveat this, not a lawyer, programmer. 
<laughs> so <laughs> take everything I say on the subject of what belongs in your privacy policy with a grain of salt, please. Um, that said, my understanding is uh, if you're running kind of vanilla Google Analytics, as long as you're expressing in the privacy policy that um, we're just collecting it, like basically you just say something to the effect of, we don't collect any personally identifying information, we're just looking at traffic metrics, um, you know, we're not, we're, not, we're not doing anything else, we're not selling your data, we're not doing anything else with your data, it's strictly for traffic information about usage on the website, you're cool. These features that we talked about uh, in terms of user ID tracking and demographics tracking and a lot of these more personal features of analytics, they're all turned off by default. So if you haven't turned them on, you're good. Um, there's not, you know, it, from a, there are things that just like your users, you have to opt into as, as an organization. I don't know if that, if that helps. And then once you, once you do, you can start to kind of say, oh, and by the way. Does every website need to have a privacy policy? Yes. And where should it be? Um, people expect it linked in the footer. That's the most common UX pattern. Um, another thing I highly recommend doing is if you run contact forms or you collect information at all about people, go ahead and have a link to the privacy policy there in the form where you ask for their email address. Um, make just a little statement that says, hey, I know you, you're a human, I care, I'm not doing anything funky with your email. Um, it'll also help your conversion rates too. Hi there. Um, I work at enterprise level WordPress and I'm interested in using some of these tools to apply them to WP admin and optimize the experience for our editors and our content creators and I wondered if you have any experience or any recommendations of, of tools for doing that. That's a really cool idea. Um, I have not done that myself, but I would think that while you know most of our plugin solutions in the WordPress environment are going to be are going to be audience facing, um, you could certainly and you could use your same analytics platform uh, for um, admin facing as well, and just insert it into the head of the document um, for admin pages only, and then do this same kind of tracking. Uh, I might actually run it as a separate ID just to make the reporting simpler. Like I don't know that I would, I would combine my analytics for my administrative experience with my consumer facing experience, but I have to think about that. Um, but you, what you can then do is actually start logging things like the user role to the, um, to the data layer and starting to use that information to figure out where people are getting hung up. Uh, I have a question. Uh, have you seen the uh, WordPress core feature plugin proposal for consent and logging? Uh, and if so, do you have any thoughts about it? Sorry, seen the what? The feature plugin proposal for consent and logging mechanism for WordPress. I haven't. Okay. I will have to check that out. Yeah. So I do not yet have an opinion, but I will okay. shortly. Well, I'd love to hear your opinion once you see it. Okay. Uh, I was wondering if you could speak toward uh, uh, site speed regarding analytics tools. Uh, we have clients in my company that they want to throw all of these uh, tracking uh, tools on there, and then they get upset when it gives them a 10-point hit on uh, page, page speed insights. Uh, is there a way to achieve kind of a, a balance on that? I'm sorry. Uh, for some reason, the echo on the mic is making it hard for me in some of these cases to understand. Okay. Could you repeat that for me? <laughs> sorry. Um, when, regarding site speed, um, yes. Okay. <laughs> we have clients that will, uh, they want all of these tracking codes on, on their site, and then they get upset when it affects their, their speed scores. Is there a way to achieve sort of a balance in that? Oh, man. Um, I haven't found the magic solution to that yet. There are a couple of approaches I take. Um, one, I look at it as, is this tracker the only way to get this information? 
Can we leverage something we already have? Can we write a custom report? Can we add something to the data layer? Can we do something in our current platforms without adding yet another thing? If the answer to that is no, then it becomes a question of how bad do you want it? Because you know, there's only so much we can do uh, about page speed. I mean, obviously we can set all, we can defer loading on all of these things um, so they get the content first. Um, but yeah, the reality is you'll put some, especially I've noticed it with like social tracking, you stick it on there and like your page score just, your page speed just tanks and there's nothing you can do about it. So I, I have literally gone back to the client and said, okay, uh, this is the net average effect it's having on, on, on page speed. How bad, you know, say it more politely, but I'm like, how bad do you want it? Is it, is it worth this sacrifice? Because sometimes it is, and that's great. Um, but if I, if I don't have another way to get that information, um, then that's just a choice they have to make. Unfortunately, I haven't found a good solution for that one yet. Time for just one last question. Time for no last questions. <laughs> All right. Great questions, y'all. Thank you so much.
Good morning. Perfect, thank you. Welcome to WordCamp US Day 2. We're excited to be here in St. Louis. My name is David. I'll be your host this morning today until 12.15. Before we get started, I'd just like to go over a few quick uh, announcements. Um, please silence all cell phones and other electronic devices. Uh, please move towards the center of the room if possible so that people coming in can easily find a seat. And please leave the seats closest to the screen available for people with accessibility needs. If you have any additional accessibility needs that we may be able to help assist you with, uh, please find our room manager. There he is. <laughs> uh, there will be a Q&A after the session. Uh, please use the mic at all times so that both others in the room and the live stream can hear you. Um, I will be running around with the microphone at that time. And in the interest of time, please hold all of your questions until the end of the presentation. If you want to speak with the presenter at length, ask if they're open to continuing the discussion later on in the support desk or the sponsor hall. And we encourage everyone to attend Contributor Day, which is tomorrow. If you've never been to a Contributor Day before and you want to know what they're about, please visit the Get Involved desk in the sponsor hall. Our presenter is Zach Tolman. Zach works to make the web a bit faster every day as an application performance architect at Conde Nast. He enjoys finding the best ways to approximate user experience with metrics, implementing the latest, latest technologies, and improving business outcomes with performance wins. When he's not at the computer, he's spending time playing hockey and guitar. Thank you. All right. All right, thanks everyone. Uh, I'm really excited to be here today to talk about performance, one of my favorite subjects. And uh, I just realized that there's something else I needed to add to the bio uh, that David read. And something that's kind of important for you understanding why I'm up here doing this talk. And that is, um, I'm what's known as a, a menu master, I think, I think everyone out there knows what I'm talking about, right? A few, there's a few people who don't, just a couple of you. Um, this is, of course, the highest tier in the Potbelly Rewards Program, uh, their, their perks program. Um, I'm not a cookie rookie. I'm not a sandwich superstar. I am a menu master. This is elite status. This is kind of a big deal. I just hope you know that. And for those who have never been to a Potbelly sandwich shop, it's kind of your standard uh, sandwich shop that probably been to before. It has um, a, a station where you come up, you put in your order, uh, they start to make your sandwich, they toss it through the oven. On the other side it comes out, you tell the people what sort of things you want on the sandwich, they give you the sandwich, then you go pay and you leave. Now I became a menu master because I ended up going to Pop Belly a little too much. In the building in which I work there is a, a Pop Belly. It's a massive building. I, I work in Chicago. It's called the Merchandise Mart. There's tens of thousands of people going in and out of this building every day. A lot of businesses in there. There's a train stop in there. So there's tons and tons of people. And at this particular pop belly, they've done some smart things to try to handle the level of traffic that they get. Uh, there's this guy, the same guy every time you come in there and he has a little iPad. You tell him the sandwich that you want. He just does something like this. I don't know what he's doing. Do, 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 do. And then that just magically beams that order over to the order station. They start making your sandwich. Well, next thing you have to do is you have to wait in this line a little bit. And you kind of go around these, these barricades and you're waiting for your, your sandwich. You're looking at your phone, doing whatever you're doing, just kind of waiting for your sandwich to be made. You kind of feel slow. You're waiting in a line. I really hate waiting in lines. Eventually, They'll ask, whose sandwich is this? You say, it's my sandwich. They'll ask you what you want on it. They give you the sandwich. Then you go to the line and you pay. So I thought this kind of cool. They did some nice things to optimize this with the guy with the iPad and everything. But still, I hate waiting in lines. I, I, I have better things to do with my life. So me being a smart person, or at least I think I was smart, I decided I'm going to go at the off hours time rather than go between noon and one, I'm going to go at 1.30, see what happens. So I did that one day, and the experience was a little bit different. The guy with the iPad was not there. 
I would go directly to the order station, I'd put in my order, and then I would stand in this line, and there's only a few people in front of me. Great, I don't have to wait in the line. But what happened is I put in my order, and then I just kind of stood here. And I was just waiting. I wasn't, I wasn't slowly moving, I was just doing nothing. Because I had very few feet to cover now. And what was interesting is that there was nobody there, but I kind of felt like this took a lot longer. Like I had, I had just more anxiety about when's my sandwich gonna be ready, kind of like looking over. And I just wasn't occupied, you know? I, I was just kind of fidgety. And overall, this experience felt like it just took a lot longer. Well, eventually I got my sandwich, I paid, and I left. And so I got to thinking about this, and I decided, well, what is the best option? Should I go between noon and one, or should I go at 1.30? I don't like waiting in lines, but it actually seemed like maybe that was faster in my experience. So since I'm into performance and measuring things, I decided I'm gonna create a metric, because this is what people who are into performance do. They just create metrics. So I created a metric called time to Sammy. And this, of course, is gonna be the amount of time it took to uh, initially order my sandwich, uh, between ordering my sandwich and getting my sandwich in my hand. So armed with this idea, I decided let's go to Potbelly and start measuring this stuff, right? Seems like a good idea. So I went down there, the first uh, trial, I decided I'd go during the noon to one rush. I get down there, sure enough, I, I, iPad guy is there. And actually in that moment, I thought to myself, you know what, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm missing piece of this. It's good that I can, can measure time to Sammy, but there's this other little step in here. After I get the sandwich, I have to get in another line, sometimes it's big, sometimes it's small, to be able to pay. So I decided in the moment, I'm going to you know, call an audible and I'm gonna also measure time to purchase. So this would be the time between getting the sandwich in my hand and the time that I'm actually uh, checking out. So I measured this and what I found, oh, did I skip a slide? Um, yeah, sorry, there we go. Um, so I measured this and what I found was that it took me eight minutes, there we go. It took me eight minutes uh, for time to sandwich. So between the time that I ordered and the time I actually got the sandwich in my hand, it took eight minutes. Is that fast? Is that slow? I, I don't know, it was eight minutes. It was eight minutes, that's what I measured. Cool, that's the, my first piece of data. And then kind of surprisingly, th this one actually did shock me, it only took me 30 seconds uh, to pay and leave. Uh, that particular day, they had three people working the cash register, so it was actually moving pretty fast, um, and, and they're, they've gotten really good at being, being fast with that. So, armed with that information, I then went to uh, get a sandwich another day, and I went at 1.30. Now this time again, the iPad guy was not there, line was much, much shorter. I put in my order, and what I found was that it took me seven minutes to get that sandwich in my hand. So time to Sammy was seven minutes. And this was a little bit surprising because again, if you recall, my, my psychological experience of this was, this feels like it's taking longer. Like just there's something, I don't know, my anxiety or something is spiked here and it's making me feel like time is, is just really, really slow. So it was a minute faster than the, the other experience. But then something weird happened. I happened to measure this on free shake day and there was two people in front of me that insisted on getting a shake. So at this particular pot belly, the people running the cash register also make the shakes. So I had two people in front of me that were taking up the cash register, the, the uh, person at the cash register's time, making the shakes and making me wait before I, I checked out. And it took me three minutes for time to purchase. This was a surprising result. So at this point, you may be asking yourself, why are we talking about sandwiches? I know lunch is coming up, but why are we talking about all this? If you understand some of the uh, ways I conceptualized measuring this and observing this and sort of the shock at times that I thought something should take longer or, or, or shorter, you're gonna understand everything about what I have to talk to you uh, about today. Um, as we build websites, as we are interested in knowing how fast our websites are, we are presented with these same problems. We all have sort of a psychological reaction to a page. If I showed you any website now, everyone could probably give me an opinion just kind of gut feeling whether it's fast or slow. But we don't really know unless we start measuring it. But when we measure it, sometimes we still don't really know because maybe we do a poor job measuring it. Maybe we conceptualize our, our, our metrics incorrectly. Uh, as you saw my experience here, I thought that the most important thing was how long would it take for me to get my sandwich and then I realized there's actually another metric that I need to look at and that's time to purchase. This is pretty common when you go about setting up any sort of web performance monitoring. You think you know the metrics you need to, to measure and then as you kind of learn more about your data, you decide you wanna add in some more metrics. 
So what I want to talk about today is how we can go about setting up this type of uh, performance monitoring such that we can think through these hard problems of figuring out what fast really is. So we're going to talk about picking metrics that might help us understand what a fast website is. We're going to talk about how we might observe it and some of the challenges in just setting up our, our measurement system. You probably all could call me out on how poor my uh, observation system was with uh, Potbelly. You know, only I tested it. I did it on two days. I did it on free shake day. There's a lot of things that are going to add some issues to that data. Finally, we're going to talk just very briefly about how we can report this data once we have it. So I want to start our journey by going back in time a little bit and talking about the load event. Just to be clear, I'm not going to recommend that anybody uses the load event to uh, try to describe the speed with which their pages are loading. However, historically, uh, timing when the load event fired on a page is something that has traditionally been done. It was a good metric because browsers supported it fairly universally. The meaning of the load event across browsers, like most things across browsers, was slightly different, but it tended to be a good measure um, to compare apples to apples processes in the browser, and frankly, it was all we had for a while. Now, if you know what the load event is, it, generally speaking, it is a, an event that fires after all of the resources and sub-resources in the page load. This was a good approximation of when things are at least available on the page, and thus they should be rendered on the page, and you can see things on the page. However, it misses quite a bit of other information. Nowadays, we're kind of bombarded by things that happen late in a page load. So uh, we just had a, a talk in this room about um, some tracking devices. There's, these cause a lot of performance concerns, and if you're only measuring uh, page load, you're going to miss them. These happen all after page load. So these will be things like scroll events, any sort of click events, animations. These can really impact your user experience, and the load event is going to miss that. If we look at the other end of the timeline, load event also does a really bad job of approximating when the site is visually ready or when it, you can kind of see stuff and start to inter interact with the page. We can start to read it, see an image, those sorts of things. There are certain assets that are going to help the page render more quickly, at least above the fold content, and then there's other assets that'll load later in the page that really have nothing to do with visual completion. If you're only looking at the load event, you're going to miss that. So obviously, we shouldn't be using the load event, but the reason I want to bring this up is because there is a legacy of thinking of page performance for websites as page load. What is your load speed? What is the page load? This is a bad metric. We shouldn't be using it, but because we took the time to define that early in the process of thinking about work, uh, uh, um, web performance, it's kind of stuck with us. One thing that I usually talk with third parties about is they will advertise that their third party is really performant. It will not impact page load. That's typically the terminology that they use, and it's sneaky because they're right. It doesn't impact page load. They will do asynchronous loading processes that bring it outside the flow of the load, mostly outside the flow. It'll be like microsecond to low millisecond uh, impact, but virtually no impact. But once those scripts start executing on the page, they go hog wild on uh, that far side of this timeline. They do all sorts of scroll tracking, click tracking, any sort of things that are going to cause problems. But because we have this legacy of the load event being this sort of exalted uh, metric, they can say, well, it doesn't, impact, uh, it doesn't impact page load. Now, fortunately, we're not in those days anymore. We are in what I would probably call the golden age of performance metrics. If anything, we've overcomplicated this, and now we have to think about what of all of these metrics are we going to choose to monitor. I decided to put a page, uh, a, a slide together where I would just put a bunch of metrics, and I was like, oh, I'm just going to keep typing until I fill up this page. This is probably, I don't know, a minor percentage of all of the different metrics that are easily available to us. There is so much, and so you kind of need to figure out what should I care about. The problem is we can't track all of these and do meaningful things with them. It's just too overwhelming. And you're going to have issues where you try to improve one metric, and by doing so, you hurt another metric, 
And if you have 20 metrics that you're tracking and trying to improve all of them at the same time, you're pretty much going to improve nothing. So you're going to have to go through a process of defining what fast means to you by looking at what we have available and tracking the things that you think is useful for your particular use case. And I think the best way to start this process is don't look at the metrics and start picking out the metrics. You're not going to a, grocery, a metrics grocery store and picking the metrics off the shelf. You need to think more about your users. I think that's the best place to start. And ask questions about your user's experience and then try to map the existing metrics onto that. So a first question that I might ask is, does the page appear to be loading? Within a WordPress context, this is really important. Um, to get the best performance out of a WordPress site in terms of page load, you're going to need, see, I, see I just, that term, it just slips out, page load? In terms of uh, that, that server render, that initial load, um, you're going to need to probably look into some sort of caching solution or solutions uh, to be able to get that time to first byte really fast. If you can get that really quickly, the user will likely have a, a, an experience that the page is starting to load, that something's happening, that we're out of just a spinning state, right? That, that something is occurring. And there's a couple good metrics to pay attention to here. There's a good old time to first byte, which just tells you the um, uh, time between the initial request and when you receive that first byte. We have the server timing API, which allows you to instrument your own backend processes and announce those to the client. And then there's a whole host of other metrics like start render, first paint, first contentful paint that all get at when something starts to render on the page. So it goes a little bit beyond time to first byte. You could have a really good time to first byte, but terrible start render metrics. So we want to look at start render and uh, first paint, those sorts of things, because that'll tell us when pixels start to actually render on the page. So that's a good indicator to your user that something's happening, that this page is indeed loading that you intended to load. But we want to go a step beyond that, and we also want to ask, is the content useful? Can I see any sort of meaningful content? Hey, it's great that you got your little hamburger icon up there. That's not particularly useful to me. I came to read an article. So there's some other metrics that are really good at that. One of my favorites is First Meaningful Paint. In the work that I do, I really, really like this. Um, I monitor uh, pages, uh, article type content pages, and First Meaningful Paint does a really good job approximating when that useful content uh, appears. We also have things like Speed Index. Speed Index is kind of complicated, but generally speaking, it's going to tell you when the above the fold content comes to rest, when that's loaded. There's a new one on the horizon called Element Timing API, which is really, really cool. It allows you to um, uh, add an attribute to any HTML tag, and it'll tell you when that tag has rendered. So you could say something like an H1. It's pretty important that my H1 gets rendered quickly. You can get timings about when the H1 rendered. Not loaded, but when it rendered. This is really critical because it'll tell you when someone could actually see that content. So it's important that we move beyond just like getting some pixels on the page. We want to get useful, meaningful pixels that people can begin to engage with. Now beyond that, we want to get out of this world of thinking that the page just loads and then we're done. We go home. No, to, to, to usually do what we want to do to convert people, whatever kind of website that you have, you're going to want people to do things on the page. You're going to want them to interact with it. You're going to want them to scroll, to click. Uh, to swipe, whatever that might be. And so we need to have some sense of what that experience might be like for the users. <clears throat> so we need to ask these types of questions. Uh, can I click, can I scroll, can I interact with the page in general? And there's a few metrics that'll help with that. Uh, one is first CPU idle. Um, first CPU idle, just like it sounds, tells you when the main thread comes to enough of a rest to theoretically receive user input. And when I say a, enough of a rest, we're talking 50 milliseconds. So theoretically, at that point, someone could interact with the page and get a fast response. Another one that's actually gaining quite a bit of popularity is first input delay. This is used when you're monitoring real users. And this will tell you when a user does that first input, so if, they, if it's a scroll, if it's a click, how fast is your site responding? The idea here is if it's responding very quickly, that means you've allowed the page to load, it's come to a rest, and you haven't just bombarded them with a bunch of other JavaScript and network requests, such that when they interact with the page, they get a pleasant response. Something is actually happening for them. 
this space is always also really interesting because there's a lot of people coming up with some creative things. I think one of, one of the great ones is Rage Clicks. I bet everyone just has an idea of what this might actually be because you've probably rage clicked a few websites in, in your time. Uh, but, but it's just generally if you've clicked multiple times in the same area within a short period of time, that is a rage click. So you loaded up a page maybe to log into a page, something like that. And unfortunately, there's all these tracking pixels coming at you. And when you're ready to push OK, log in, it just doesn't work, and you click, 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 click. That would be a rage click. So there's some fun things kind of coming out of, the, out of uh, the web performance community on this. Now, the final thing uh, that I would encourage you to look at is not only do we need to get to this point of being able to initially interact with the page, but we need to stay there. We can't just say, OK, let's let someone get that initial action, that initial conversion step that we want, and then let's just bombard them with all this JavaScript and network requests. We want to make sure that the page continues to be usable. And there's some good metrics that help with that. One is time to interactive, which is similar to first CPU idle. Um, there's, this is a kind of a complex metric, but the general story here is you're looking for a time period of five seconds in which there is no main thread activity that's greater than 50 milliseconds, all while there are no more than two concurrent network requests. What that means is you're just trying to not hammer the main thread. You're not trying to do a lot of JavaScript operations. You're also trying not to do a lot of network requests. If you're, at, if you're um, fulfilling those requirements, then likely the page is ready to receive more inputs and be able to respond quickly. In that same vein, we have long tasks. Long tasks is a, a standardized term. That means a task that takes more than 50 milliseconds. If you have a ton of these type of tasks, it's likely going to get in the way of user interaction, so we want to try to minimize these. And then I, I wanted to mention user timing API as the last thing in, in this section of the talk, because user timing API allows you to measure whatever you want. It just allows you to add timing marks throughout the page, uh, page process. So you can do this for, for this particular step or any of the steps that I've already mentioned. Um, we tend to use user timing API for these longer tail uh, page experiences. So if a user comes to a page and we're trying to improve, say, login speed, we'll use user timing to understand each step of the login process. So when they focused on a form field, uh, when they clicked submit, those sorts of things. And we're able to time that with the user timing API. So ultimately, we're able to get to a point where we no longer have a single metric that sort of misses part of the page load experience. And we might do something like this. We choose to make sure that the page is appearing by watching our time to first byte. Then we ensure that we're getting meaningful, useful content by monitoring first meaningful paint. We want to make sure we're getting to a, a point where we've loaded our, our initial JavaScript payloads, our initial network requests fast enough that our first CPU idle looks good. But then we also don't want to bombard our users after the fact. Uh, and so we want to keep the site usable with time to interactive. I want to be clear here. I'm not saying you should do this at all. But as uh, I've done some of this work, this works really well for the sites that I monitor. It works really well because uh, first meaningful paint is probably our most important metric because we want to get content to users as fast as possible. Timed interactive becomes extremely important because unfortunately in the business that I'm in, we deploy a ton of third party uh, vendor code. And one of the best metrics for catching some bad stuff in that code has been timed interactive for us. So we, we, we watch it with that. Point here is just look at the different sort of experiences you want for your users. Think about these and try to map these metrics to them. Now, um, oh, and sorry, I just wanted to mention that uh, this approach is called user-centric performance metrics. This is not something I invented at all. Um, Philip Walton from Google wrote a really great blog post on this. Um, you'll get the slides afterward, and you'll be able to see that link. So moving on, you picked your metrics, OK? Just like I did with Pop LA, I picked my metrics. Now you need to go measure them. Did I make a few mistakes when I measured the Pop LA stuff? Yeah, right? Like, I think everyone could find some, some, some scientific flaws or just some basic flaws in this. Um, we need to go about measuring the metrics, and uh, we need to do this with some concern to how we get a representative sample, how we get a good understanding of what our page looks across a number of different experiences. And there's a couple of different ways we can do this. The first is synthetic monitoring, which is going to be your lab-based monitoring where you control all of the conditions of the, of the testing. 
hopefully, if this is done correctly, then when you see changes in the metrics, the changes are because of the change in the composition of the website, not in your testing apparatus. We're gonna contrast this with real user monitoring or RUM, which is, which is something where we will deploy script to our sites that allow us to monitor real user visits. So for synthetic monitoring, it's kind of neat because you're able to dial in the location, the network, uh, the device, the browser, all these sorts of conditions about your actual test. Now you're probably gonna say, well, if you only test one of each of these, then you're only getting one type of experience. That is absolutely correct. So you need to look at your analytics, try to understand who your users might be, and try to find that representative sample. If nothing else, I highly encourage you to look at sort of mobile, sort of slower experiences because people have a lot worse experiences with your site than you may realize. Definitely don't, um, don't take a position of privilege when you're looking at this and assume everyone has the best networks, the best uh, iPhones, Android devices. Um, what we actually do, and I find works really well, is we look at kind of a low-end mobile uh, viewpoint for our website. Uh, it's really nice because it, it does a very good job of highlighting performance issues and areas where we have room to improve. Now beyond that, the other thing you really need to think about is test frequency. And this is where I see people kind of failing the most. Every one of you would have called me out if, if I was truly reporting this, this science that I did with Potbelly, every one of you would have called me out on this and saying, well, that was just a, like two samples. What does that actually mean? Frequently, in, in the web performance world, I see people run, they'll go find whatever the current test device that we're using these days, whether it's web page test, Lighthouse, Google page, uh, PageSpeed Insights. Um, they'll run a test and say, my score is 43. Done, right? Like, that's it, that's just 43. It's probably not gonna be representative because again, you're testing from one particular location, you're testing from one tool, you're looking at one set of metrics, you're looking at a highly aggregated kind of fake um, uh, uh, a score. So one thing I would highly recommend is as much as you possibly can, try to increase the frequency with which you're doing your testing. This becomes difficult because there's some economic realities to this, it becomes expensive very quickly. Uh, as an example of this, uh, at Condé Nast, we started using SpeedCurve, which is a fantastic tool for, for performance monitoring. Um, but because we have so many brands that we needed to monitor and we wanted, we wanted to monitor so many templates, we were, our budget limited us to only testing each combination of a brand and a template once in the morning and once in the evening. Can you imagine what we found with that? we would have these, these craziest spurious results where we would see good performance in the morning, bad performance in the evening. And then, oh, that performance returned the next morning, we're, we're good again. Was that a real result or was that just some random variation at that time of day? Did we happen to hit an uncached page or something like that? We don't really know. So increasing the frequency can help quite a bit in this case. We ended up developing our, our, our own tools based on Lighthouse to be able to dramatically increase the number of tests that we're able to do um, in, in the thousands per, uh, per hour. And we had an experience like this once that I wanted to walk you through and just show you why synthetic can be really important. So this is in a, a, a emulated mobile environment. That, that line is hanging up around uh, 20,000 milliseconds. This is our time to interactive metric. And we had this hooked up to some alerting systems and we found one day that this you know, metric is bopping along just over 20,000 and then it just shot down to around uh, like 17,000. That's a pretty, pretty big change and it's sustained too. It wasn't just, uh, you know, just, it wasn't a freak sort of thing. And then what we, so what we did is we wanted to look into that, like what's going on? I love to see performance improvements. This is really great, right? But when I'm not expecting to see a performance improvement, I have some questions. <laughs> typically this means we're no longer delivering some JavaScript that we used to be delivering. That's what this is typically going to indicate to me. After we searched it down, what we found is that we made a change to our ad library that actually broke another third party that we knew was really bad performing, but it was really important for business reasons. So we had to go in and restore it. It's a weird case and it's the only time I'm probably gonna stand up here and say, we fixed a problem by making performance worse. Uh, 
but we at least were able to keep track of this because we had a sufficient, um, uh, sufficient test coverage to be able to see uh, that number drop right away. We were able to resolve it. If we didn't have this, and again, we were doing the tests um, you know, twice a day, this probably would have taken us weeks to find because we wouldn't see that, that trend um, for quite a while because again, we would, we would see that drop initially, but I'd probably be like, oh, well, there's just something weird about that particular test, gonna ignore it. This allowed us to see it right away. Now, in contrast to synthetic monitoring, we have real user monitoring or RUM data. This is very different in that we are adding a, a client-side JavaScript to our users' browsers that allow us to uh, measure different things that happen uh, while they're visiting the site. This is really good because you get a good view of what your users are actually experiencing, whereas before we had to determine what was the right sort of test setup, here we don't actually have to think about that at all. We just need to capture all the dimensions of that user's visit so we can understand what may be influencing their metrics. One of the first problems you're gonna run into with RUM though is there's instrumentation challenges. A lot of these tools that we've come to know like web page test, Lighthouse, they have the advantage of being run outside of the browser environment in that they are not dependent upon what JavaScript can currently do for us. Web page test, for example, takes videos, it takes screenshots, and then it uses that information to compute their metrics. You can't do that on the client. So you're gonna have to deal with developing the same type of metrics or new metrics based on what you can actually do on the client. You're also gonna have to deal with cross-browser issues, which are no fun. But if you're able to do that and you're able to do it successfully, one of the advantages you get is you have a lot of extra variance in your testing data. Variance is good in this case, again, because you are able to see a wider view of what your users experience when they visit your website, rather than just this very specific view that you have synthetically created. On the flip side, variance is a little bit difficult because it's really hard to see the signal in all the noise because you're gonna get some, some difficult to interpret data in there. As an example of this, that same incident that I just reported, we caught that in our RUM measurement tools. This is what it looked like. If you recall that last graph, there was a clear dip. You could see it and then it came back up. Here, if you squint, you can kinda see it, but the magnitude was probably about two to 600 milliseconds here, whereas within our synthetic tools, it was, it was just way clearer. We would probably have spotted this in our RUM data after probably three or four days, we would see that that changed and that it was a stable change, but it's a little bit harder to catch in RUM data. My recommendation here is that if possible, you should test with synthetic but verify with RUM. Synthetic is just easier to work with. It really is easy to set up synth synthetic testing and then you can instantly start testing whatever sites you want. You don't have to deploy any code to the, to the sites that you're testing. We actually use this to be able to test competitor sites so we can compare ourselves against competitors. But it's always nice to verify with RUM and occasionally what I will do is I will take a look at the current state of our synthetic data, look at what we're seeing in the real world and just make sure that we're kind of on track with each other, that we're not getting completely different results. Okay, so now that we've talked about how you might go about observing performance, we need to figure out what happens once we get that data. So, um, mode is not working. So once we've observed our performance, we have to do something with all that data that we have. This presents a whole host of new challenges. I'm only gonna touch on a few key points, but just realize that this could be a whole talk unto itself. The first thing that you're gonna grapple with is what number do I report? Should you report means? Should you report medians? How about percentiles? Uh, means are known to be pulled by outliers, so it can be a little bit mis mis uh, unrepresentative of your, your data. Medians, are a crude way of controlling for outliers, so that's kind of nice. But I like percentiles because you can look at different percentiles like 25th, 50th, 75th, 99th percentile, and it'll give you a sense of people who are having really good experiences, um, you can see that. People who are having really bad experiences, you can also see that. Histograms have become really popular. They allow you to bucket each response into say one to two seconds, two to three seconds, four to five seconds, 
And then what you're able to do is count how many people had each of those responses and then look at that distribution. It could tell you some really interesting problems like majority of your users are getting fast experiences, but there's this weird hump down around like 10 to 12 seconds. What does that mean? It can, it can reveal some other information that these single number estimates will hide. I've also been looking at standard deviation a lot recently, and standard deviation will tell you, if you look at all of the measurements you've made, how closely coupled are they? So are, they, are you seeing things that are wildly different from each other, or are they generally, are they the same? Since the sites that I work on tend to be, you take some data, you apply it to a template, and you should get the same result, but it's just gonna look a little bit different because that data is, is different. The expressions of those pages across brands, across different sets of data should look relatively the same. The performance factor should be relatively the same. So I look for standard deviations to be fairly tight there. Now when you report this, I, I just would highly recommend that as you're getting used to this, take a look at different values. So this is a graph showing you the median and the 99th percentile for um, uh, time to interactive with our RUM data. Um, for those in the back who may not be able to see this, the blue line is around six seconds, and it's fairly stable at six seconds. The yellow line, which is our 99th percentile, is going everywhere from like 25 seconds up to 95 seconds, and there's ju it's just all over the place, right? So what this tells us is that we were only looking at the median, we'd be like, great, six seconds for time to interactive but we are ignoring this long tail of responses where we have users that are having really bad experiences. So what this suggests to me is that we need to figure out what's going on up there, especially to try to improve the magnitude of those, those spikes to see if there's anything that we can do to improve those users' experiences. It's probably having to do with a lot of third-party pixels and that type of tracking stuff. Another thing that you wanna do once you have your data is if you can, start alerting on this data. This can be a little tricky because performance data can be not so stable. If you can find metrics that are somewhat stable, start to integrate some alerting based on it. Um, I don't set off any pagers with performance alerts, mostly because they're just so unstable that we see a lot of um, erroneous uh, type of alerts. But we do have a dedicated Slack channel where these will pop into and some interesting data we will follow up on. A good example, um, just earlier this week actually, we were monitoring our first mean meaningful paint times. I really like this metric because this is really stable for us around two seconds. And we saw this uh, increase in the first meaningful paint time, which triggered one of our anomaly-based alerts. And we were able to jump in and see what was going on. Turns out a new build I did for our performance monitoring tool introduced a new version of Chrome that changed our metrics. So we had to adjust that a little bit to uh, bring our score back down until we can investigate why new version of Chrome is doing this. But what was really cool, again, we were able to respond to this very quickly rather than waiting weeks to figure out why our data changed. The final thing I wanna say about reporting is there is sort of an accessibility issue to this that when you get into collecting this type of data and you've done all of your thinking about what metrics we should use and why we should use them, this can be kind of hard to communicate. And different people within your organization may or may not honestly care. The question that they wanna answer is, is it fast? Yes or no, let me know. Has it gotten faster? Has it gotten slower? I wanna know. So sometimes you may find yourself in a position where you're trying to communicate about your page's performance, but it clouds the message when you have to start talking about what time to interactive is, what first meaningful pain is. So a few things that I've learned that I find are very helpful is if you can phrase your data in terms of percentage change. On, our, on the metrics that we track, we have improved 5% over the last two weeks. That's an easy message for people to digest and they understand people who want to know information will then follow up and say, well, what does, what does that mean? What are we actually tracking? You can have those conversations. Another really powerful one is competitor analysis. This is very easy to do with synthetic tools. You can test any page in the world. Um, we use this because I, honestly, like I, I know that other publishers have the same constraints that we do, but some of them are doing better than us. Some of them are doing worse than us, and I want to try to figure out the ones that are doing better as how we can get there. 
Um, so I, I'm very particular with this one when it comes to first meaningful paint because we have a lot of control over that. The third parties don't have much control on that. So I, I look at this one closely and try to figure out how we can get to our, our best competitors uh, level of performance. The last one is product comparisons. So let's say if you are redesigning a site, if you're launching a new theme, those sorts of things. An obvious thing to do is compare the new thing versus the old thing. Hopefully, in this day and age, as we're building websites, we're conscious enough about things like performance accessibility uh, that we are comparing these as we're doing that launch. This is a very easy thing to talk about. When we launched the new thing, we got 15% faster. That's the type of results that people want to see. Think about how you take your data, distill it down into a message like that when you're talking with certain audiences. I found that to be very powerful as opposed to just showing everyone a dashboard. So as we wrap up, um, I just wanted to mention that, um, yeah, so uh, it's really important that you go through this process to understand what FAST means to you. This is going to set up a performance culture for your team, your organization, uh, yourself, even your own way of thinking about what's FAST. What you'll find is that everyone has their pet metrics. Um, I often talk to people who will come in and say, hey, why is the site really slow? And I've been, I watch these metrics religiously, and I'm like, the site's not slow, it's no slower than it has been, like there's no reason for this urgency. Typically what happens is someone has pulled a metric from one of these very accessible tools out there and says, well, this number is bad, and I want it to be better. That's a hard conversation to have, but you need to have a viewpoint on why you think that number actually isn't that representative of what you are doing, what your organization is doing. Ultimately, if you are able to set those parameters, if you're able to define that, that helps you set up your performance culture rather than having someone else or some other organization that has published one of these tools define that culture for you. It's worth doing, it's really hard work, but I promise you, if you do it, it will pay off. My slides can be found here. And yeah, any questions? Uh, I have the signal if you have a question, I'll bring the mic to you. I have many questions, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, I, but the, you know, in fairness, um, I mean, this, this, what you talked about applies really well for large scale businesses with high volume traffic. What does a smaller guy do? And, uh, you know, I mean, to, you know, without a budget, without a, you know, high traffic site, but you still have to worry about performance. Right. So uh, I would highly recommend Speed Curve for one. Uh, take a look at them. They are, they're doing really good monitoring. Um, their product is fantastic. It's actually, fairly, I think they have a free tier even, and if not, I think it's fairly affordable at the lower end. I know I kind of bagged on just taking two measurements a day. If that is an increase from zero measurements a day, you're winning, right? Like, let, let's keep moving in that direction. Um, the metrics that they're gonna highlight are gonna be very good. They've done a lot of this thinking for you. Uh, depending on what you are doing, though, with your website, that, may, more, that be, may be more or less pertinent for you. So um, if it's a standard, just sort of like displaying content type of page, um, those tools are gonna be really good for you. I'm a big fan of Lighthouse. You can run that right in Chrome browser. There's a lot of other ways you can run that. Um, typically, SEO is going to be a big concern for a lot of folks um, probably here. So um, Lighthouse, I don't think anyone's come out and said it, but probably how Google is understanding whether a site is fast or slow. And so if you are trying to improve your SEO by improving performance, that's a incredibly good indicator for you. Thanks for the presentation, great presentation. Um, piggybacking off the last question, how, how would you recommend smaller agencies talk to those smaller clients who only care about the Google page speed 
especially now that the site kit has come out of beta and that's probably going to be a number that a lot of smaller clients are going to be seeing on their site all the time. Right, that's a really good question. So uh, I'd probably give you the same general set of recommendations. Um, I would look for a tool that, is, that allows you to monitor these sites and allows you to show what performance is doing to their sites. The, uh, the guy who built SpeedCurve initially, I think, that was his motivation, is that he wanted to be able to make that argument. But the tools we had were sort of developer-centric, so you can get a lot of data, but then it would be on you to take that data, graph it, and try to visually convince people. Um, SpeedCurve does a lot of that work for you. Um, I think if you did a series of, of Lighthouse runs on a site, that could be very helpful too, to show where that performance uh, stands. Um, I imagine as you are working with those companies, you probably are having a process where you're trying to understand what their goals are and what they're trying to achieve. Through that conversation, I think you can attach their goals to things that are likely important in terms of performance. So everyone wants a fast website, but a, an e-commerce site versus a publishing site are going to have very different performance goals. If you as a smaller agency sort of have a sense of, of, of what your niche is in terms of who you're selling to, you should probably have a, like an opinion there. You should probably know that for most people who are doing X, they should probably be concerned about these four things and then try to roll that into your process. All right, and our final question. Hi, uh, great talk. I, I was curious, uh, there was no mention of Search Console. Is that ever, does that ever tie into your work? Um, no, it does not really tie into my work. Uh, we, so in, in, in my org, we do have people who are watching SEO very, very closely. I, I don't generally like SEO tools personally, um, but it's also, I, I say this as a person who is very ignorant when it comes to um, that world, because I've just n never done a lot with SEO. The biggest issue I've had when I've done some stuff with it is the feedback mechanisms are really poor. You make a tweak to something that you think is going to help SEO, and it may take a while to get that feedback. And in the meantime, other things have happened that may cloud that picture. Um, it would be really fantastic if we had better signals more quickly to understand if our performance changes are impacting the SEO changes. That said, I. One thing I didn't go into here um, was that it's always good if you can tie your performance metrics to your business outcomes. And so a business outcome is obviously going to be information that you're getting about SEO. If you're ranking better, uh, just generally your, your search results are, are, are much higher in the page. If you can tie that very clearly to changes you've made with, uh, with regard to performance, that's a really important outcome, and that really suggests strongly that your work on performance is, is worthwhile. And I think that's it, so thank you, everyone.
before we start, I'd like to go through a few things. First, please help mute your cell phones and any other electronic devices that may make a noise during the presentation. And next, if you could help move into the center and the front row, that would be highly appreciated so that people who arrive a little bit later can get to the empty seats more easily. Uh, and if you need any help uh, during the presentation or in the between, uh, please find our volunteers, including me, and we're happy to help you out. Uh, usually we'll have questions, uh, we'll have time for Q&A at the end of the presentation, but for this one, uh, the presenter let me know uh, maybe there won't be time for Q&A, but if you want to discuss more about what he talks today, uh, you can meet the presenter at the liquid web table uh, in the sponsor hall after this presentation. Uh, we will have the contributor day tomorrow, and well, everyone is welcome to join us. If you have never been to one and you're not sure what it's about, um, please visit our Get Involved table in the sponsor hall to check it out. Uh, everyone is welcome and no previous experience is required. It's a great way to know other people in the WordPress community. Okay, that's all for logistics, and I'm very excited to introduce you the first speaker in this afternoon, Steve Grunwell. Steve is a senior software engineer at Liquid Web, working primarily on the managed WordPress and WooCommerce platforms, specializing in WordPress and web application development. He has a passion for teaching, develop, uh, for teaching and contributing back to the development communities through speaking, blogging, and open source work. When he is not writing tests or finding new ways to automate the world around him, uh, Steve is off spending time with his family, enjoying a fine cup of coffee, playing guitar, and otherwise getting away from the key keyboard. <laughs> Let's welcome Steve. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Uh, let me make sure my, my clicker is actually on because that would be, there we go. Bluetooth, it's amazing. Welcome, everybody, to Confidently Testing WordPress. Uh, my name is Steve Grunwell. I'm at Steve Grunwell on all the social networks that matter. If you're the kind of person who likes to follow along with the, your own copy of the slides, you can grab them now at stevegrunwell.com slash slides slash testing WordPress. Uh, don't worry if you don't grab it now. It will be at the very tiny uh, at the bottom of each and every slide. Um, but uh, there are some code samples on here, so if you're like, I don't want to have to squint, uh, feel free to follow along or move closer. Um, I also want to apologize ahead of time. Anyone else really like injure their knee going down that 10-story slide last night at the after party? Because I, I have a, a limp right now, and it's kind of an off and on thing, so I promise I'm not faking it. It's legitimately quite painful. Uh, but that's not what we're here to talk about. Let's talk about automated testing. Now, as we start talking about testing, it's necessary to understand the role that automated testing plays in software development. So automated testing, uh, by taking all of our testing processes and scripting them, this makes them uh, easily reproducible. We're not dealing with, oh, well, developer A went through and did these things, but developer B does these things, and then something slips through because B was doing QA, and uh, A would normally catch that, but B totally dropped the ball. We're making sure that everybody is running the same thing. We're reducing that chance of human error. When we have a solid automated test suite, this can be the gateway to that holy grail that is continuous integration and continuous delivery. And if you're a CI, CD nerd like me, Come down to the liquid t web table. Uh, table is uh, not an appropriate term. The liquid web living room setup downstairs in the sponsor area. Um, but we can start automating the entire process from the time we write the code to the time we deploy it to production, which is really cool. But automated testing plays a vital part in letting us do that confidently. Now, when we talk about automated testing, there are a few different types to consider. And depending on what area of software development you're in. Different communities will have different names, uh, but generally speaking, we're going to frame them in the following three types. First, we have the noble unit test. Now, a unit test is meant to test the smallest possible unit uh, uh, of your application. Now, unit 
uh, is often going to be a single function or a single method. But unit can also be subjective. Some people will look at a unit test and say, you know what, just testing that that one function behaves exactly the way I expect it to isn't exactly a unit. It, it, everything gets a little fuzzy, and, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Next up, we have the integration test. Now, integration tests are going to take all of those individual units that we've tested with our unit tests and answer the question, do these work together in the way that we're expecting? Finally, we have our end-to-end -end test. This might involve scripting a headless browser to literally load up a web page and click through uh, these links and fill out these form fields, click submit, and here are all of our assertions around it. Now, as we organize our tests, um, we like to do so using what we call the automation testing pyramid. At the bottom of the pyramid here, if my laser pointer decides to work, oh, it's just not visible. Okay, this isn't gonna be helpful. Um, at the bottom of the pyramid, we have our unit tests. Uh, we want to have a, a strong foundation of unit tests. Unit tests are going to be cheaper to write, cheaper to process, uh, to execute. They're going to run really quickly. Uh, you want to have just as many unit tests as you can. As we move up the pyramid then, we get to the integration tests. These may be a little more costly to write. They might be a little more involved. Maybe you're stubbing HTTP requests. Don't worry if I'm using words you don't know yet. You will know them by the end of this talk, I promise. Um, but they might take a little longer to run. Maybe you actually have to deal with writing something to the file system. Or maybe you actually have to spin up an entire instance of your app rather than just calling a single function. Finally, at the top, we have our end-to-end -end tests. Um, these are going to be much more expensive to run because it may take you know, a minute to spin up a headless browser, navigate to that page, click through all of these things, submit things. You're actually, in many cases, making HTTP requests. Uh, so end-to-end -end tests are going to be the most computationally expensive. Um, therefore, we want to have, uh, relatively speaking, fewer of them than we do the easier to run uh, and more effective, in my opinion, uh, types of tests. Now, for the sake of this talk, we're going to focus on the bottom two-thirds of this pyramid. We're going to talk about unit tests and integration tests. We're going to consider end to end tests kind of out of scope for this particular talk. Uh, as we discuss testing, it's necessary to understand the term SUT or SUT. I'm not really sure. I live online and we don't say things out loud. But the system under test, or uh, I think it's SUT. SUT, anyone have a real preference either way? No? Okay. Um, this refers to the current system that we're trying to test. If we are testing an individual function, we don't wanna have to worry about, you know, well, is the API that it calls out to working properly? That's not what we're trying to test. So as we write our tests, we wanna frame them in a sense of what are we trying to accomplish with our tests? And then how can we get all of the other stuff out of the way so we're just focusing on what's important for this particular test? Opening water, very difficult on stage. All right. So what I've laid out so far is kind of the, the ideal. Okay, you're going to have your unit test suite. You're going to have your integration test suite. You're going to have your end-to-end -end test suite. It's going to be great. Everything's going to be beautifully isolated. Well, then WordPress comes along. And... Um, WordPress likes to muddy that up a little bit. So if you are a hardcore, I subscribe to unit tests and integration tests and never shall the two intermingle, um, WordPress is gonna be a little painful. So we do have to shift our mindset a little from traditional testing over to testing WordPress. Now, why is this? WordPress at its core is a very tightly coupled system. We have a lot of global variables in play. You can filter almost anything. So it's really hard to test any single item in true isolation. It's built like a teenaged application because it is a teenaged application. But that doesn't mean that we can't test this effectively. And that's what I wanna show you how to do today. So let's meet our testing toolbox, the things that we will use to confidently test WordPress. Uh, we're going to start with PHP unit. Uh, PHP unit is kind of the de facto test framework slash runner slash whatever you want to call it uh, within the PHP community. If you've worked in Laravel or, or literally any other PHP application framework, you've likely dealt with PHP unit in the past. It's also the basis of the WordPress core test suite. The structure of PHP unit looks something like this. Uh, we're going to have at least one 
test suite. Now, a test suite is a collection of test classes. And a suite might be your unit test suite, your integration test suite. Sometimes people do a feature where it's kind of technically an integration test, but let's spin it and say, let's write them around a feature rather than like a, a class. Um, the test class then, it's a literal PHP class, it's going to contain a collection of one or more test cases. The test case in turn is a single scenario to be tested. It's a method on our test class. Everyone following the terminology so far? Cool. And PHP and it also likes to mess it up because they call the base test class test case, which is just totally awesome, but yay, PHP unit. Um, a test case then is going to be con uh, comprised of one or more assertions. Now assertions answer the question, do things work the way that we expect? PHP unit comes with a ton of default assertions, enough that I could not go through all of the stuff you just get out of the box with PHP unit during the 45 minutes of this talk. One of the nice things about PHP unit though is that you can also extend these assertions. You can write your own custom assertions um, and bundle them with the framework. I'll show you some of the ones that WordPress has included in the core test suite. Um, I'll also show you a library that I wrote available as a composer package uh, to add some custom assertions that can be helpful. Um, but let's take a look at some of the core stuff that we get out of the box with PHP unit. First and foremost, we can answer the question, is it true? or is it false? And you'll notice a pattern as we go through this, the eagle-eyed viewers in the audience anyway. But we can do something like assert true, and this is going to do a strict comparison, so a triple equals, if you're used to writing uh, equality statements in PHP, uh, is something exactly equal to the Boolean value of true. Conversely, we have assert false. Is it exactly equal to the Boolean false? We can check equality. We could do something like assert equals, which is basically a loose type comparison, a double equals rather than the triple equals. Uh, are these two things roughly the same if we coerce them into the same type for comparison? We could also do assert same, which is going to check a, a, a triple equals, so it needs to be the exact same. Um, keep in mind, if you are doing objects, these need to reference the same object in memory, uh, meaning uh, if you have like two different post objects, and they represent the same post, but they occupy different spaces in memory, this test will fail. That has bitten me more times than I care to admit on stage in WordCamp US. Oh, wait. We can verify contents of things. Um, we could do something like assert contains. Uh, in this case, we have, we're looking for the string B in an array that contains three strings, A, B, and C. Well, this would pass because B is right there in the middle. We could do assert regex. It's hard to actually say. Again, we don't say things out loud. We're developers, we're indoor kids. Um, but we can do regular expression matching. Does a value match a pattern? In this case, does the, uh, the string foobar match the beginning of the string anchor, a capital F followed by one or more lowercase o's? Why yes, yes it does, so that would pass. Now each assertion has an equal and opposite assertion uh, as a general rule. So for assert equals, we're also going to have assert not equals. Assert contains, assert not contains, assert array has key, assert array not has key, assert count, assert not count. I think you see where I'm going with this. Generally, they're going to be in the form of assert thing and assert not thing. But here's the, the fun eagle eye, did you see what we're doing? Really, everything comes down to this idea of searching for truth. Is it true or is it false? Every assertion is just trying to answer that question. So when we look at our assert equals, really it's just doing assert true, expected, double equals, actual. If we're doing assert not contains, assert false on an in array statement, excuse me. If we're doing regular expression matching, do a preg match and do we have at least one match? Everything comes down to true or false and that's kind of the key to understanding assertions in our tests. Now when we take all of our individual test methods and we string them together, we get an output that looks something like this. This is actually from a, a production application. Um, you can see, if, if you're close enough to see the slide, uh, we're running PHP unit 7.51. There were a total of, what was it, 511 test methods called, uh, 1,085 assertions among them, four of them were skipped. It took 1.13 minutes to run through all these tests and occupied 42 megabytes of memory. It ran through 1,085 different assertions in 
a minute, just over a minute. Um, if it, I were to test all of these things manually, this would take all day, a couple days maybe. Um, so I'm able to run through this stuff very fast and I can make sure that it's running anytime I want to. Now, if something went wrong, we might have an output that looks like this, where we have dot, 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 dot. Oh, look, there's a, a red F, uh, and it tells us exactly where it failed. In this case, we were in the coffee test class, the method of test get good coffee. It failed asserting that great, well-balanced coffee is equal to Starbucks. Um, those two are not equal. So if I asked for good coffee and it gave me Starbucks, we've got a problem with our application. I was going to say no offense to the Starbucks fans, but uh, just don't at me. Um, but failures show up and they say, hey, uh, it was in the my plugin test, testcoffee.php file on line 14 where your assertion failed. So we can go into the test and we can see, okay, what's going on here? Now, as we test things and, and keeping in mind that idea of the system under test, Sometimes we want to get things out of the way in our code, and this is where test doubles come into play. Now, test doubles could be in an entirely separate talk in and of themselves, but the general idea is let's remove any variables from our code and give ourselves control values that we can work with. Yes, we're scientists now. You are all officially testing scientists, and I'm very proud of you. Uh, so you might do something like stub out an API, because again, we're not testing the API that we're, we're integrating with. We're saying, if I call the API and the API gives me a 404 error, how is my application or how is my plugin responding to that? How am I recovering from it? If I get a 500 error over there, what happens? If I get good data, am I handling it properly? We don't wanna have to actually call out to that API. Sometimes that can involve expense. If you're building something that's going to provision like a new server and that you're gonna to have to pay for that, you don't want to actually do that. Plus, that takes time, and I'm very lazy and want things now. Um, we could also uh, make sure that, for instance, um, if we're calling a particular class, that certain methods on that class are called because we know that there are side effects there. Um, and we'll look at, at some more of these examples coming up soon. Uh, when dealing with test doubles, a popular library within the PHP community is known as Mockery. Um, Mockery gives us this nice fluent interface for designing uh, test doubles. So in this case, we have a test method, uh, test handles empty order list. Um, so we are creating a mock of our API class, and we're creating a partial mock. Um, Mockery lets you do this idea, or the concept of a partial mock, where basically I'm going to tell you how to behave when certain methods are called, and for everything else, just proxy it back to the original, let it do its thing. Uh, in this case, we're saying, okay, we have our, our test double for the API, and it should receive a call to the get all orders method uh, exactly one time, and it should return an empty array. Then we're making an assertion. We're saying, okay, when I call API get recent orders, I'm expecting that get recent orders is going to call get all orders, and when it calls that, it gets an array, so I expect to see empty because, of course, if we don't have any orders at all, we definitely don't have any recent orders. Um, a bit contrived, but... It's so nice to be able to say, oh, my API mock should receive get all orders once and return an empty array. There's also this composer library that I mentioned earlier. Um, sometimes people are writing end to end tests and getting really frustrated because it takes like minutes to run when really they wanna say, hey, I'm testing my WordPress plugin and I wanna make sure that uh, under these certain conditions, something is rendered to the screen. Um, some people try to get around this by, okay, I'm going to do the thing that'll render it to the screen and ensure that I see the, the exact text. But sometimes text changes, or you're looking for a particular class name, for instance, and then another class gets added. Uh, we love adding classes as developers, and then suddenly, like, the string matching isn't quite working. So PHP uh, unit markup assertions lets us use DOM document to basically make DOM queries. So you could say, I want to use the short code. I want to make sure that it's rendering this markup uh, and this markup should have this class and contain this text within this selector, for instance. So this can be a nice bridging the gap, like, haha, you don't have to go headless browser quite yet. Um, and that's available through GitHub. Now let's talk about the WordPress core test suite. Uh, and if you haven't noticed, I'm throwing like a million things at you because then as you get into testing, you're going to be like, 
okay, I know what that is. Steve mentioned that. Oh, that was a gotcha, and now I know that assert same and assert equals are not equal. Uh, but the, the WordPress core test suite, this is what WordPress core itself, hence the name, uh, uses to make sure that all of the, uh, the, the lovely PHP in WordPress is behaving the way we expect it to. If we want to use the core test suite for our plugins or for our themes, we can do that. And WPCLI makes this very easy. Um, if you haven't worked with WPCLI before, uh, go install it and it'll change your life and you'll be a much happier person. Um, but we can run WP scaffold plugin tests and then your plugin name. Uh, we could also do theme tests, although in practice, plugin tests tend to be more effective. Um, plugins tend to contain more business logic that are worth throwing a lot of tests at rather than themes where it's like, assert that the home page shows the home page. Like, it's not as useful. Um, so for the sake of this, let's say we're working on a plugin and I'm going to generate tests for it. Uh, you can also generate brand new plugins with WPCLI and then say, yeah, give me the test suite set up out of the box. So when we run that WPCLI command, we get a few different things. We get phpunit.xml.dist, which is our PHP unit configuration file. We get uh, PHP code sniffer, because that's a coding standards checker if you haven't used it before, awesome. Uh, we get a Travis setup if you're using other CI servers, or CI providers, rather. Uh, you can select from a few different ones, but most people are going to be familiar with Travis. We get this uh, install WP test shell script. Um, this kind of, this, it gets copied between so many projects, but this will set up your WordPress test environment because you actually need an instance of WordPress to test against. We get uh, test slash bootstrap, which we'll take a look at in a second, and we get a nice little sample test saying, hey, this is what your test should look like. Now, one key thing that we don't get is a composer file, uh, composer.json. Uh, again, if you haven't worked with composer, um, welcome to the future of PHP. I mean, relative to where WordPress core is right now, the rest of PHP has been using it since uh, 2012, I think. Um, but Composer lets us describe our dependencies and we can say, I wanna load in that PHP unit markup assertions package that Steve was talking about. Or I wanna bring in a local copy of PHP unit and tag specific versions for it. So we can run Composer in it, uh, fill out a few details, and we might get a JSON file that looks something like this, where we have the, the package name, a description, the license, um, define that it's a WordPress plugin, so then it, we can actually script where it gets installed. Um, and in this case, I'm requiring PHP unit uh, 7.0 or higher um, as a dev dependency. A lot of plugins that I write will have a file that looks exactly like this. Um, it's also, going back to this, worth noting, PHP unit is currently on version eight, and as of when I checked like an hour ago, uh, WordPress core still does not support PHP unit eight. There's an open track ticket. Um, I'm happy to pull that up at the end of the talk, uh, but let's, let's do this, because PHP unit eight is, um, Nice. So the bootstrap file that I mentioned a moment ago, this is basically what uh, PHP unit is going to run anytime you say, hey, I want to run my tests. So it loads up this bootstrap file. Uh, it finds where your WordPress installation is. If you're using a tool like VDD for your development environment, um, it'll automatically, unless you've configured otherwise, have a, an SVN copy of WordPress trunk, and it'll, or no, the WordPress develop, and it'll work against that. Um, you can also, that shell script that WPCLI scaffolded uh, will um, throw it in the temp directory uh, by default. Uh, then we're going to include a file from that to make sure that we have access to the next function we need, which is tests add filter. Works just like add filter, but it's for testing specific stuff. And in this case, we're going to in make sure we're injecting our plugins main bootstrap file uh, into our WordPress environment. So basically, hey, you spun up the test WordPress environment, make sure my stuff gets linked in because that's what I'm trying to test. And then finally, we let the WordPress core test suite uh, bootstrap. So this makes sure that WordPress is getting set up uh, and we're able to actually execute all of our tests. I mentioned earlier, uh, PHP unit will typically be extending this PHP unit framework test case uh, thing for a test class, bless you, uh, which is really inconvenient, um, or not inconvenient, but uh, really, problematically named because it's a test class, not a test case. Uh, if you've worked with PHP unit in the past, you're probably used to extending PHP unit framework test case. When you're working with the, excuse me, working with the WordPress core test suite, however, you are going to be using the WP underscore unit test case. Um, 
so at least theirs is, no, it's also a test case. Darn. Um, but this is going to handle the bootstrapping of WordPress for all of your tests. It's able to do that through a tool known as fixtures. And you can use fixtures yourself as you write your tests. A lot of times we have uh, scenarios where we want to make sure that certain things happen before every test. And rather than writing it in each and every test method, we can write it once. We could do a setup and we could say, great, before each and every test method, I want you to run this. Um, we could do teardown. So if you have to clean up something, you could say after each test method, whether it passed or failed, do this to tear it down. We can do this at a class level. If you only want it to happen once at the beginning or at the end of a test class, we could do setup before class or tear down after class, for instance. Um, you'll notice in here, uh, I am doing the parent tear down after class and parent setup before class. Uh, because WordPress uses fixtures, we want to make sure we're not completely overloading the methods and then WordPress test suite can't bootstrap properly. Um, so we want to make sure that we're adding to what WordPress is doing rather than just wholesale replacing it. We have the concept of groups within PHP Init where we can group tests, whether they're in the same file, across different files, whether they're in completely different test suites, um, in whatever way makes the most sense. So in this case, I have a, a test method that is in both the posts and post meta group. If I wanted to just run anything related to posts, but I don't necessarily care about the post meta stuff, I could just run PHP unit dash dash group equals posts, and anything tagged in the group of posts will be run, no matter which test suite it happens to fall in. Uh, where this comes in really handy uh, is if you have a large test suite and you wanna make sure that you're not running like absolutely every test on everything, you're like, I just made this change in this one place and wanna make sure that related things aren't going to break. Um, groups can also be applied to both the test class, so the PHP class, um, or to individual test methods. Often in our testing, we might have situations where it's kind of uh, the same test is sort of being repeated, but with different data, you know, kind of same scene, different actors. So PHP unit gives us this nice, cool, nice tool also nice, cool, I guess, nice, cool tool, uh, known as data providers. Data providers basically let you say, here's a set of scenarios, I want you to pass these as arguments to this test method and run through them uh, without me having to just copy and paste the same method over and over again. In this case, uh, we're defining, we have my test my function method, it's just doing a quick assert equals uh, expected compared to my, the return value of my function with uh, our value parameter. So we've specified a data provider for it, and we say, great, uh, foo and bar should be arguments, and then bar and baz. This will run two different test methods, but we only have to write it once. If we want to add a third or a fourth, we can just add to the array defined in the my data provider method. Excuse me. Now, if you are working with really simple data types, just kind of uh, strings or integers or other scalar data types, we can also use the nice at test with annotation, uh, so you don't even need to define the data provider method, you can just say, hey, these are the different test scenarios I want to do. Functionally, these two are equivalent, but this one only has to define one method. Now, getting into some of the, the WordPress specific things, um, a lot of times in our data, or in our tests, we need to define test data. Um, and going through and saying WP insert post or uh, creating a user and then going, what, do, what am I going to name the user? Uh, personally, I like to use the Beatles as long as I only need, well, up to five. Sometimes Sir George Martin is in there. Sometimes Billy Preston gets traded out. But uh, at least the core four there I've used plenty of times. Um, but the WordPress core test suite gives us this idea of a factory, which is just let me generate dummy data. This isn't significant. So if I need to create a post, for instance, I can say this factory post create. And it just, it creates the WP insert post and, um, and it returns the ID of the newly created post. If I need to get the post object that was created, I can say create and get, <laughs> excuse me. And instead of the, the post uh, ID, we get the entire post object. If certain parameters are important, if I need to make sure that like a post with a given title appears in search results or something, I can set those arguments as necessary um, by passing an array to the create and get or the create method. So in this case, I'm saying the post title will be my test post and the post author will be author ID. Let's say I generated an author and then I generated uh, a post and assigned the author to that. So that author now owns that post. 
Maybe I want to give that author multiple posts. I could do something like create many uh, and say, I want to create five posts and assign them all to this author ID that I've generated elsewhere. Um, this makes it really easy to set up scenarios where I want to make sure that you know when an author has this many posts, maybe they're limited and they can only have so many posts assigned to them as part of your plugin logic. You can actually test that very easily by generating this dummy data in your tests. Now, WordPress uh, is very big on roles and capabilities, so sometimes we need to test things as different users. Uh, we can do this using the WP set current user function. We pass a user ID. I believe you can also pass a user object. Don't quote me on that. Uh, but we might do something like, test authors can't blow stuff up. It seems like a worthwhile test to have. So let's go ahead and create an author. Uh, we'll just use a factory. Uh, so this factory user create, give them the role of author, and then let's set the current user so that resets WordPress and basically says, hey, I'm that person now. And then we want to do an assert false, current user can blow stuff up. Good capability check, we're making sure that you know, it's not operating in kind of this zero user sort of role. We're explicitly saying, hey, given that I'm acting like that person, uh, can I blow stuff up? And I hope the answer is no. In our tests, sometimes we also have to check conditionals. If we're on certain pages, are uh, certain things being set or certain things being triggered? So we can do that using the go to method defined within the core test suite. Um, it is important to note that the go to method does not actually make an HTTP request. It does not actually change the page, but it regenerates the, the query of ours for the page and the globals and everything as though we had visited that page. So if it does require that you literally navigate to a page, you're going to have to go a step further than this. Um, but for many cases, in this case, we're checking the is home. It starts off false. We go to slash blog, and assuming we don't have the latest post showing up on the front page of the WordPress instance, um, is home should be true. Hooray. Uh, if you've worked with PHP exceptions before, you might notice that they are uh, notably absent from WordPress in many cases. Um, but WordPress has kind of a, a substitute for legacy reasons known as the WP error object. It behaves a lot like a PHP exception. And sometimes we need to make sure that, hey, if I called this, I expect to get back a WP error because maybe the parameters uh, should not qualify. Um, so we have an assert WP error method. I believe there's also a certain not WP error because again, the rule of for each and every assertion, there's an equal and opposite assertion. There should be a cool name for it, um, but I'm not that clever. Um, but going back to that idea of the search for truth, really all this is is assert true is WP error or assert false is WP error. Um, so as you kind of understand how the assertions work, it's like, a, okay, everything's just kind of yes or no. So I've thrown a ton of tools at you, some terminology, some structure. Let's get in to writing some actual tests. Now, as we write our tests, it's necessary to understand how these things should be arranged. And this is a pattern known as arrange, act, assert. Uh, arrange, we're going to set up the scenario. We're going to generate whatever users we need to. Um, we're going to generate posts. We're going to set any global variables, anything like that. Next, we act. We actually execute the system under test. Finally, we make assertions around it. This isn't a hard and fast rule. There will be situations where um, maybe you are actually uh, just hoping to not get an exception, for instance. Uh, but generally speaking, our tests are going to follow this pattern of arrange, act, assert. So let's sit, go back to permissions and say we're doing a, a test around permissions. So uh, test non-admins cannot clear the cache. Great. So let's arrange the situation. So we say I need a user uh, who will be an author. An author is not an admin. Cool. I'm going to uh, use WP set current user to begin impersonating that user. Now I'm going to test the system under test. I'm going to call my plugin clear cache. And then uh, I'm going to store the response in this response variable, and I'm going to inspect the response. I'm going to make some assertions around it. So assert WP error. Uh, uh, that should, should pass because I should get a WP error saying, hey, you're an author, you're not permitted to do this. I might want to check the response code. If we're explicitly saying it's going to return a 403 because we're kind of following HTTP status codes, I want it to be forbidden. I want it to say, you can't do this, you don't have permission. 
if we're registering custom post types, as we are one to do, uh, we might want to make assertions around the custom post type, making sure that someone didn't come in and accidentally mess something up. Now, the easiest way to do this, we don't really have much of a, a setup um, because the, we probably have a function where our custom post type is being defined. But maybe we call my plugin register post types, uh, so it sets up the custom post types it needs, and, and then we say, great, I want to get my book post type object, and then I want to start making some assertions around it. We don't really care about the labels and things. If someone goes in and changes that, that's not as important. But maybe there are key things about it. Assert not null the post type, making sure the post type actually got registered. That's probably important. Uh, maybe it needs to be a public post type. We want to make sure no one went in and accidentally flipped it to a private post type. Or hier excuse me, hierarchical, that's a really hard word to say, especially on stage. Um, we want to make sure that, you know, this post type, uh, like a book does not have sub books uh, in this particular use case. We start making assertions around this. We may have to do something like testing hooks. Um, there are some nice functions within WordPress as part of the plugin API, so actions and filters, uh, that people don't spend as much time around. We're used to, you know, add action, do action, add filter, apply filters, but we can also say did action. WordPress keeps track. Has this action executed? And how many times? So in this case, we might call my plugin function, and if we need to make sure that, the, uh, that an action was called within there, we could do an assert same, uh, one, and then did action, my plugin action. If that action was not called, or it was called three times, this test will fail and tell us exactly what's going on. Sometimes we need to get a little more sophisticated, though. And we can start using closures because, again, we're living in the future. Thanks to WordPress 5.1, we don't have to worry about 5.2 compatibility for PHP, um, which is the greatest news I've had all year. Um, but we might do something like, okay, add action on the my plugin action hook, but pass it a closure. And I like using this approach where I have a called variable. I pass that by reference, import it into the closer, closure using the use keyword. Um, and then I do a bunch of assertions within the callback. So I make sure that uh, my closure gets called and it might make assertions about what's going on. And then at the very end, as long as all of those passed, we set called to true. And at the bottom, we're asserting that called is indeed true. So if the function didn't actually call the action, we're not just passing and saying like, yep, everything was cool. Um, we're keeping track of like, not only did it pass all of the uh, the assertions within our closure, but did that closure actually get executed? WordPress likes to uh, print a lot of things directly to the DOM, um, echoing out rather than uh, just returning strings, for instance. So let's say we're testing a template tag, and we need to make sure that it's going to have particular content. Or in this case, we're doing a, a short code. So we might do something like use output buffering within PHP, which basically says, hey, anything that you were about to echo, yeah, I want you to hold on to that for a second because I might need to do something with it. So we might do something like an OB start, so output buffering start, uh, called do short code because that's typically going to echo something directly out. And then at the end, call OB get clean, which basically says, okay, closing down the output buffer and anything that you had captured in that, let me put it in a variable. And then we might do assertions around that. We might say, I'm looking for an H2 with latest posts um, because that was, in this case, the title parameter that we passed. If we don't get that, we fail, but we're able to actually test this output. Now, if we know exactly what output we're looking for, and not just a portion, but like the whole thing, we could even shorten this. If it was only supposed to output a, uh, the H2 tag, um, we could use PHP units expect output method and say, hey, we're expecting this, so go ahead and set up the output buffering for me. I wanna make sure that I see this, and if I don't see it, fail the test. A really popular and uh, necessary thing to do within uh, WordPress testing is stubbing HTTP requests. Now, typically with WordPress, we're going to be using the WP HTTP API, say that three times fast, uh, and responses for that are going to come back in as an array. So we get things like the headers, the body, uh, response that'll contain both the code and the message, any cookies, uh, file name in some cases, um, but the the HTTP API contains this pre-HTTP request filter. By default, it's going to pass false as the first value, and if it gets anything else back, it says, cool, I'm not actually going to make this request. 
You tell me what you want me to return. <coughs> Excuse me. So we can use this for testing. And if we want to test that when this calls out to the API, I want to get a 200 response back with this data, or I want to get a 404, or I want to get a 500, or I want to get a 401, or whatever, we can stub this out uh, so that we're not actually calling out to that API. Remember, we're not testing the actual API. We're testing our plugin. So let's take all of this and let's put it together. Uh, if you haven't heard the term TDD, or if you've heard it but it's kind of confusing, uh, let me break down the, the basic idea behind test-driven development. First, when we're going to write a new feature, we want to make sure that we're writing a failing test to describe the way that it's meant to behave. When I call this function with these arguments, I expect to get this back. When I call this function, I expect these actions to be fired because those are necessary as part of our API for other people to interact with it, whatever. You describe how it's supposed to work. You haven't written a line of code yet uh, for the actual function, but you're describing how it should work. Next, you're going to write the smallest amount of code necessary to make this pass. This might not be production-ready code. This might be very ugly. This might be very hacky. This might be very, <coughs> excuse me, unperformant. But all we have to do is get that test to passing. Now we know that we've actually implemented the function in a way that it meets our expectations. Now we can go back and we can refactor that code. We can clean it up. We can make it more performant. We can say, oh, geez, are we defining a closure in a loop or are we looping through like a full table scan on the database for no particular reason? Let's not do that. Uh, and please, don't do that. Um, but this process is often referred to as red, green, refactor. Red, we have failing tests. Green, we make them pass. And then as we're refactoring the code, if we go red again, we know that we messed something up. We broke it, so we need to step back and we need to reevaluate how we're refactoring this code. But we have those tests as kind of guidelines around it. This can also be really useful if you're fixing bugs. This is what we call regression testing. So imagine we have a function like this. Recent post heading, it takes an array of posts, and depending on the number of posts, it'll either say there have been no posts in the last 30 days or there have been X posts in the last 30 days. I'm really hoping at least one person in the audience is already like, I see the bug, because we're gonna see it. Uh, so let's run it, and it's in production, and we see, okay, if there are zero posts, it says there have been no posts in the last 30 days. If we have one post, it says there have been one posts in the last 30 days. Ugh, that makes my skin crawl. And then two posts in the last 30 days, you know, that, that's fine, but th that one, that is a sticking point. That is grammatically incorrect, it makes me sad, it makes Wapu cry, we don't want that. So, let's write a test for it. Let's go in and let's write a test to reproduce the situation. In this case, we're gonna use a data provider and we're gonna say, great, uh, you're gonna generate some number of posts and then here's the expected output. Uh, so, for zero, there have been no posts in the last 30 days. Let's say for one, we wanna switch to the word one rather than the numeral, we can do that. So, one post in the last 30 days and then two posts in the last 30 days. This test describes how we expect it to behave. We haven't changed anything in the code, but now we can come back over here, we can run the test, and we see, okay, we're failing on that situation of one post in the last 30 days. We're expecting to see one post, singular. We're still seeing the number one, posts. And Steve is still crying, and Wapu is crying, and it's a big, like, Wapu Steve hug. Um, so, now that we have a test to reproduce the scenario, we can go back and we can fix the code. We can say, great, let's add an else if. And we say, if it's exactly one, go ahead and say one as a word rather than a numeral, one post singular in the last 30 days. Now, if someone new comes on the team or there's a merge conflict or something, and let's say someone comes on and they say, you know what, else if is like a huge code smell and I will not have it in my code base. So they go and they remove it. Well, then our test starts failing because we have this test saying, hey, we had a bug, we fixed the bug, and now we've regressed. Someone broke this behavior. So we can slap that person on the wrist and say, no, LSIFs are fine, be smarter about it. Um, but we're catching this before it rolls out to production and breaks again, um, because breaking stuff on prod is no fun. So with that, I wanna thank you all, I know that was a Tremendous brain dump. Uh, as mentioned earlier, I will be done with the liquid web table following this. 
Um, looks like we do maybe, oh, no, I'm like right on time, aren't I? Sweet. Uh, yes, O'Doyle rules. So I will be uh, down at the liquid web table and thank you very much.
good afternoon again. Uh, thank you for being here. For those who have like didn't sit here for the first session, my name is Nancy Yu, and I will, I'll be your host today. Uh, before we start, uh, please help mute all digital devices that may make a noise during the presentation, including your mobile phone. And, and at the end of the presentation, we will have time for questions. Uh, please make sure that you use a microphone on, uh, in the Q&A part so that people on the live stream and people who help provide the captioning can hear you clearly. And please think about your questions ahead of time and keep it brief and direct so that we can get as many questions covered as possible. And please ask one question at a time so that other people get a chance to ask as well. Uh, the last thing, we have the contributor day tomorrow. Welcome to join us and you can check our get involved table in the sponsor town hall if you're not sure what it's about. Um, okay, so next I'm going to uh, introduce our speaker for the next session, Tentech Chalik. Uh, Tentech has been active in open web standards innovation, development, and advocacy for over 20 years. He is currently a web standards lead at Mozilla, community leader of indiweb.org and microformats.org, and participates in the W3C CSS working group. He is the author of HTML5, now a step-by-step -step tutorial for getting started today. He co-edited the W3C recommendations, CSS 2.1, CSS3 Color, and CSS3 UI, co-founded GMPG, Barcamp, IndieWeb.org, and was chief technologist at Technorati. Um, Tentech lives in San Francisco and has bachelor and master degrees in computer science from Stanford University, as well as a strong background in human interface and user-centered design from his many years at Apple Computer. He shares his thoughts at Tentech.com. Welcome, Tentech. I don't think we've even seen the tip of I don't think we've even I don't think we've even seen the tip of the iceberg. I think the potential of what the internet is going to do to society, both good and bad, is unimaginable. I think we're actually on the cusp of something exhilarating and terrifying. It's just a tool though, isn't it? No, it's not. No. No, it's an alien life form. What do you think, I mean, when you think then about it? Is there life on Mars? <laughs> yes, it's just landed here. But that's, it's a simply a different delivery system there. You're arguing about something more profound. Oh yeah, I'm talking about the, the, the actual context and the state of content is going to be so different to anything that we can really envisage at the moment. Where the interplay between the user and the provider will be so in sympathetico, it's going to it's going to crush our ideas of what mediums are all about. Hi, my name is Tantek Chalik, and I remember 1999. But today it's 2019. We're here 20 years later, and the internet has not quite turned out as David Bowie envisioned it. Or perhaps it has such, had such a profound change as he had envisioned it, but a bit differently than maybe any of us foresaw. Today's internet is an internet where disinformation rules social media. Where Facebook and other social media, but primarily Facebook, profit directly off of advertisements, political and otherwise, but especially political, um, that misrepresent information or outright provide disinformation to manipulate users. And if threatening democracy uh, wasn't enough, um, Facebook amplifies misinformation and harassment uh, conspiracy theories, all sorts of extremism. A few years ago, 
Facebook started showing posts in an order and selectively based on a custom algorithm rather than what a lot of us remember, which is reading posts on feeds in the order that they were posted by who we follow. Who remembers using a feed reader? Who's used a feed reader before? Yes. Ah, uh, those days. But now what Facebook's doing is amplifying, uh, you know, besides reminding us of birthdays of our friends, which is a good functionality, uh, the algorithm is tuned to provoke you and amplifies the things that upset you the most, get the biggest reaction out of you, including anniversaries of terrorists. If individual terrorist anniversaries weren't bad enough, Facebook itself has been complicit in enabling outright genocide in Myanmar. Now these are screenshots here uh, from my friend Charlie Owens' presentation that she did at Beyond Tellerand. Um, but this is something that fortunately we still have open search engines in the open web. You can use Google or others, DuckDuckGo, et cetera, and find all for yourself as well. But yes, we now have social media that outright enables genocide. What, what, what have we done? What has the internet done to our planet? What has the web done? So to bring it a little bit closer to home, Facebook is also censoring speech by folks that are the most vulnerable and underrepresented online. Merely discussing racism or aspects of racism, they've labeled hate speech. Um, and to the point where it's, it's a large enough phenomenon that users have actually started to give it a name, calling Zucked, being taken off the platform. Of course, as we've seen with, rec with their recent announcements, if you're a politician, Facebook has said you can say whatever you want. Their standards don't apply. And it's not just censoring underrepresented minorities. It's also outright profiting on advertisements, on advertisements for hate. This is not the web we want. As a speaker, one of the things I did was sign a speaker agreement here to speak in front of you. And as part of that speaker agreement, it listed, and I had to agree to, the WordPress principles. And one of those was literally like not being abusive, not being hateful. You know, one of our, one of the principles of this community, right, what holds us together and keeps us together as a community, these standards aren't being applied to the web as a whole, and something's gotta change there, especially for companies that profit off of it. This isn't an accident, right? They've, their senior executives have disclosed that they've been designed literally to manipulate and, and exploit human vulnerabilities. So if you feel like you're being, you're, you're coming with a different emotional reaction after reading social media, it's designed to do that. This is a, a, a study by Harvard uh, an explanation about the different uh, dopamine pathways in the brain and how they impact the way that you think, your cognitive processes. Now, a study found that Facebook had explicitly designed into their UI and their the general user experience uh, features that took advantage of each and every one of these dopamine pathways. So not content to find a way to manipulate us, they're trying to find all the ways to manipulate us. And to me, this is one of the saddest parts of what Facebook is doing uh, to our society, is that the algorithms are amplifying the messages that are polarizing and fragmenting all of us. They're feeding us opinions that we didn't have before as if to push us further apart. What was meant as a site to connect people is disconnecting people, 
families, friends, as long as you keep clicking and keep refreshing. They've been conducting experiments. They know this. They've been conducting live experiments, sending people different information in their feeds to see, is this going to change your mood or not? And the results were yes. They could actually make you feel better by picking a certain subset of posts from folks you follow or make you feel worse. So they've literally figured out how to tune in, do they want to make you happy or sad? And then they can do that at will. And they learn that by experimenting without disclosure. Others have studied usage of Facebook and other social media, and the conclusions in general seem to be pretty clear that it does actually make you pretty miserable. Right? And these studies have been going on, I'll point this out, since 2013. This isn't new information. This has been corroborated. And since then, the algorithms, the manipulation, all of that has been further optimized. I feel like when I go outside and you know, visit any sort of public area, like a coffee shop, this is a very common scene. What do we see? We see a whole bunch of people, friends. They look like they're hanging out. They look like friends. They're sitting close together. But what are they doing? They're all staring into their devices. They're not interacting in person. Something's been lost. So I could go on and on about all the different things that's wrong with Facebook and what they've done. But fortunately, Wikipedia has an entire page dedicated to the criticisms of Facebook. It's the only social network on Wikipedia that has its own criticism page on its own, apart from the main page. And if you find this page, you may find, well, it's, it's already got a warning for you. It's too long and to read and to navigate comfortably. And I'll, I'll briefly show you why. Here's the table of contents. It just keeps going, going. Yeah, every time I've loaded this, it just seems to get longer. It keeps going. Well, you get the idea. So darn you, Facebook. What have you done to us? What can we do about it? We can get angry about it. No, wait. That's exactly what they want. They want you to get upset. They want you to get angry so they can manipulate you. So what can we do about this? I have a suggestion. Stop scrolling Facebook. Come on, say it all with me. Stop scrolling Facebook. It's not good for you. It's only good for them. Even better. Stop checking Facebook. I know it may seem hard. And I, I'm from the generation that remembers when we used to reflexively check our email. <laughs> oh, yeah, OK. You know what I'm talking about. But now that's become Facebook. So what if we just stopped checking it, or maybe checked it less often, once a day, once a week? What would happen? Well, what can you do instead? Maybe nothing. It's amazing how productive doing nothing can be sometimes. Just leaving a moment of emptiness in our lives that are filled with staring at screens all day, oftentimes at night, oftentimes right before we go to sleep, first thing in the morning. Maybe choosing to do nothing at all is the most rebellious act. Or maybe go outside. Find someplace green, a park, some hills, a meadow, some beautiful rock formations, whatever, whatever you happen to have nearby, and go for a walk. You don't need your devices. You don't need connectivity out there to enjoy nature. You don't need to scroll. Maybe you'll come across some flowers. Maybe you'll be inspired to take a picture of those flowers, because they look pretty. And then you want to share them. Oh, wait. <laughs> I 
So I'll take you back to 1999 to show you just a snippet of the optimism back then. Once again, David Bowie, true pioneer and legend. He launched his album in 1999 on his website, davidbowie.com, 20 years ago. Now, albums drop all the time now, right, on various different services. But who knows an artist that drops their album on their own website still? Anybody? There's got to be some examples. I mean, let me know. But David Bowie was doing that back in 1999. Did we even have music on the web in 1999? How did that work? Maybe Flash? OK, let's fast forward 20 years again. 2019, here we are. We're at WordCamp US, right? This is awesome. I hope you all have had a great time. I'm honored and privileged to be speaking here. This is my very first WordCamp. When I was walking around the City Museum yesterday, I got to see a slice of the, Word Camp, of the WordPress community, and I was truly impressed. Lots of different people coming together, lots of different conversations that I kept hearing. All kinds of optimism among people. This is an amazing community that y'all have built, and you should be proud. More than just a community, you've got an amazing set of speakers here, most of whom have their own websites. And I'm just going to show you a few of them, because I think it's awesome that we've got a community here where most of the people presenting have their own websites. And they are so different. This is Tammy's. This is Aruba. I I'm, hope I'm saying that right. Ahmed, it's a web developer. Jenny Wong. And a lot of these, like you don't need a lot to have a website. It's great. Nice and simple, clean. It's like that screen of nothing I was pointing out to. Sometimes less is more, calmer. You get to appreciate what someone wants to express. I think it's great that people have one page or even really simple websites just saying what they do and what they're up to and how to contact them. I mean, just look at all the design and work that's been put into some of these sites. Beautiful. This is the beauty of the web of the independent open web is that you can choose what you want to put out there, whether it's a one-page site, whether it's a nice and simple design, very clean, minimal content, or a bunch of graphics and design. You can choose. You can choose to do that. You can still choose to do that on the web and not be put inside someone's little blue box that they've designed, kind of like a slot machine to keep you addicted. You can still choose your identity. Every one of these speakers has their own domain name that I showed you there. Every one of them had a nice, memorable domain name that they could tell you, that they could show on their badge. You could easily remember, type it in, look it up. This takes mere minutes for anyone to set up, to grab a domain name from a, your favorite provider, there's lots of providers. A little bit of help with a GitHub site if you want to do it without having to invest in a web host or a service. You can do that. They'll do free hosting for you, even with HTTPS. And you can have a small one pager. In fact, that's what this is. This is literally one page index.html. Go in there, change the name, change the image. You've got a one page website. Next step, if you so choose to, now that you're owning your identity on the web, is to own your content. 
How many of you have your own blogs? I would expect a lot of you do. Excellent. I mean, this crowd, of course. I should hope so. So you know this message. Um, own your content. Post what you want to post on your blog, on your site first, and not just your long form content. So once again, looking through WordCamp speakers. There's lots of different ways you can display posts. You can show them as a list. You can show them as little summaries, featured images. Maybe like just a really simple list of headlines. That's fine too. And dates. I love it. Nice and clean. Nothing to distract me. Is there a like button? No. Do I need one? No. It still works. And then once again, we see the incredible diversity of expression when people do this on their own sites. I mean, there's so many, there were so many great posts here, I mean, great sites, that it was hard to show them all. But I want to at least show you a few of them. Because some of them show you whole posts on their homepage like that. Right? Nothing to distract you, no little sidebar saying, click here, look at this. It's great. It's a wonderful experience. Jenny Wong again, she chose to put her notes on a separate page rather than her homepage. You can do that too. You don't need to put your stream on your homepage. You can put your notes on a subdirectory. You can put whatever you want there, as she demonstrates, little like yellow sticky notes, quotes, lists, photos, everything. So it's not just for long form blog posts. You could even put your tweets on your own website instead of Twitter. Here's another one from Elaine. So once you've chosen your identity and you've started to own your content, putting your content on your own site, the next thing that doing that allows you to do is to choose your connections, to have control over where does your content go, and almost more importantly, how do people interact with it? Like, how do you want people to interact with your content? That should be under your control, not the control of some large company somewhere. So choosing your connections, what does that mean? Let's look at an example. David Wolfpaw, he wrote this recent blog post about this book. And if you scroll all the way to the bottom, it's a great post, so I'll let you read it later. If you scroll all the way to the bottom, you'll see something you don't see on a lot of blogs, but you're seeing more and more of, which is there's actually an area where he's listed likes and mentions. Hmm. So he's deciding to display that down there. That's cool. This is a blog post by David Shansky. He's been kind enough to come and uh, help with this. About a plugin he just re released, an update to. And again, you scroll to the bottom, and he's chosen to display his likes in this way. Nice little calm face pile, little face group of folks. And the interesting thing is, these are not necessarily coming from any place in particular, but they're coming from people's websites. It says it's a like, but it's not a like because they liked it on his website. They liked it on their own website. How is this possible? Two building blocks, two very key building blocks, web mention and microformats too. Web mention is a W3C recommendation. It's been a recommendation for over two years now. 
It's got a huge open test suite, dozens of interoperable implementations, and the purpose of Web Mention is to standardize how one website mentions and communicates with another. What does that mean? Comments, likes, reposts, RSVPs, all these different ways of interacting with content, responding to content, Web Mention has standardized. How many of you are familiar with something called Pingback? A lot of folks, but less than half. Interesting. Web Mention, in many ways, is the evolution of Pingback, but taking through the standardization process, going through lots of rigorous scrutiny for security and spam problems, right? We all know how much spam problems Pingback had. But most importantly, redesigned from a user perspective to provide user features like comments and likes and reposts, not some special other thing called a pingback, right? Pingbacks always looked kind of ugly, even when they weren't spam. So Web Mention is the evolution of that, standardized by the W3C. And beyond just creating a comment, it's also a protocol for doing things like updating a comment, like editing a response to something. You can't do that on Twitter or even deleting it and notifying the other side that you've deleted it. So how you tell the difference between all those is a standard called microformats too. How many of you are familiar with microformats? Bunch of folks, okay. WordPress, in the good old days, supported a bunch out of the box, classic microformats. Microformats too is the evolution of microformats that have taken a lot of lessons into account, including what we've, what we've learned through the WordPress experience through themes and through web designers using microformats. What are the ones that work? What are the ones that break? And microformats, too, has been engineered to work much more reliably with a formal parsing specification and open source parsing libraries in pretty much every language. But of course, PHP, Python, all the popular languages are all there and well supported. So with those two and a handful of vocabularies, H entry, which is itself derived from the Atom standard. How many of y'all have an Atom feed on your site? Okay, a bunch of folks. That's what H entry is, but in HTML. And similarly for, uh, for contact information, H card. So if you have an author, and all that is in the specification. I won't go into too much details. It's easy to look up. This is an example of a general web architectural methodology called small pieces loosely joined. We try and make sure these specifications, each of which does one thing really well, works well together with the others, like a set of building blocks rather than a stack. And this method has allowed us to evolve this kind of interoperability fairly rapidly and continue evolving it. So let me show you a couple more examples here where the different types are even cl clearer. This is, again, a post from David Wolfpaw one of your speakers here, about WordCamp Austin. So he recapped it, lots of nice photos, and then let's look at the bottom. Okay, 11 comments. That's pretty cool. Where's this comment coming from? Manton is posting this from micro.blog, a completely different site, and it showed up here as a comment, right? You can't even tell it came from a different site instead of a local comment, except for that tiny little hint at micro.blog. Right. And if you hover over his link, you can see that it links to a permalink that's on a different site. So there's dialogue going back and forth between these two different blogs. They're just commenting back and forth. It's like the vision we had of how the web would work, how the open web would work in the mid-2000s, finally realized. And again, he's showing some likes there as well. So he's chosen to separate out the display of his comments and his likes and his reposts, his mentions. You could interleave them if you wanted to. That's up to you. You get to choose. That's the point. Here's another example by David Chansky. And again, someone's commenting from micro.blog. That's a very popular service with indie web functionality. Commenting back and forth, and a few, couple of likes. So I've shown you a lot of WordPress examples just to show you that it's not just WordPress that works with this. Uh, here's a post uh, by a colleague of mine called uh, 
Mark Thiele. And he runs his website on a CMS called Kirby. So he actually posted, and I thought this was kind of ironic because it's about Medium, um, where you don't actually control a lot of the experience. Uh, you're, this is what your users will see oftentimes if they're using Medium too much. But he's actually chosen to not just show the likes, but put them in a nice little grid and reposts. And then the comments after that, right? It's all up to you, however you want to show it. And these are coming from all over the place. Some of these are coming from Twitter, sometimes people's websites. You get the idea. This stuff works. See some familiar names there. So this is all part of a larger movement called the Indie Web. And how do you get on the Indie Web? Well, some of you may already be on there because you have your own domain and you have your own website. That's all it really takes to get started. But you want to start doing some of this peer-to-peer -peer stuff, commenting back and forth, liking people's posts, implementing these new protocols. We provided people three different paths. One is to use a turnkey service, like micro.blog. That's the one that I was showing you earlier. You can sign up there, and just like within the last week, they announced domain name hosting as well. So it's a, monthly, it's a service that has like a monthly fee. You sign up for it. Um, it supports out of the box all these indie web protocols I've been showing you in standards. You don't have to do any configuration, installation, anything. You buy your domain name. You walk through their steps. You can go ahead and interact with anyone else that's got those protocols enabled, including all those WordPress blogs I was showing you. The second, obviously, is to use a CMS. Like, we all know that. Use WordPress with the plugins, the Indie Web plugins. They're supported for that. Um, that same David Chansky I said has authored several of those. So he's going to be with me here afterwards to do Q&A. There's other CMSs that support some of these Indie Web protocols as well. Like there's Drupal. There's a Drupal plugin that does it. And there's a bunch of others. And the last choice. Obviously, is to, if you want to hack on these protocols yourself, if you're a hardcore web developer, uh, maybe you want to make your own CMS to try and experiment with them. That's fine, too. The point is that no matter which one of these paths you want to take, you're supported. There's a whole community behind getting you set up to just be on the indie web. There's a whole community of folks in the indie web that use WordPress. In fact, I'd say probably by my estimates, about half the people do. Doesn't surprise me. WordPress is popular, right? We all know this. And there's a bunch of us, myself included, who's actually done the hard work and, well, maybe we're just stubborn, to actually write our own mini CMS to make things work. So once you're out there publishing your content, you've chosen, you've chosen your connections, you've chosen how people can interact with your content, there's a whole other piece of the equation. We start, I started this talk by talking about, I mentioned the algorithm, the reading experience. And this is one of the harder problems to solve. But we've made really great strides here. Within the last year and a half, a number of new readers have, have come out. How many of you used to use Google Reader? I, I certainly did back in the day. Wow, a lot of you, about half. OK. So Google Reader was great. But one of the challenges was I never could really interact with the content. It was one way. I got to consume. It was nice. I mean, we didn't even know it at the time, but appreciated because it showed us the content of the people we followed in the order that they posted. I mean, I know. What an amazing innovation that we didn't appreciate. Um, plus, it didn't hide posts randomly for us. It showed us if you subscribe to someone's feed, it would show you all the posts in their feed. We took that for granted. But we couldn't respond. We couldn't reply. We couldn't like. We couldn't interact. And social media provided that kind of sense of human interaction for us. And so a lot of us switched to that. Enter the world of indie readers, indie web readers, or what we're calling more broadly social readers that allow you to actually interact with the content that you're reading instead of just consuming it. So you're, seeing a piece of, you're reading an article in your reader, and you want to write a short comment? Great. You can do that right in your reader. And it'll post to your website using a protocol called Micropub. 
in the background transparently because you've enabled it. Kind of like those, all those applications that we used to use to post on Twitter. Remember there were like dozens of different ones? Now there's like maybe a handful. Well, this is indie web readers, social readers are like that, but built on standards. So they work with WordPress. So they work with micro.blog, no matter which one of those you choose. So there's much more of that on the website, indieweb.org slash reader. And there's a, there's a blog post that I wanted to show you called Into the Personal Website Verse by Matthias Ott. And into it, he basically holds forth on why making your own website, having your own website is so important to him as a web developer. How many of you are web designers or web developers? Wow, okay. How often do you read about a new CSS technique or a new JavaScript library that you wanna try out but you're not quite sure like, how to make it work? Right? All the time. I feel like we're always learning in this industry. And into it, he points about, into this article, he points out how the best place to try those things is your own website. Try and experiment. Right? You can't do that on social media. You can do that because it's your own website and you have control over it. So I'm going to give you just two links that are hopefully short enough for you to remember in case you're interested in joining this growing movement. One is indieweb.org slash start, and that's a whole getting started page, again, with those options I was telling you about, using a service like micro.blog, using a CMS like WordPress, or starting your own CMS if you want to be a developer, those different paths. There's a whole web page there linked for getting started with WordPress in particular. But almost more important than just getting your website to work with other websites is the community of people making this work. And you all understand the value of community. You're here in person. IndieWeb.org slash events. There are small camps, just like WordCamp held, around the world, where enthusiasts that want to get their website working with other websites or that want to hack on the latest protocols and formats get together and help push the boundaries of what we can do with our own websites. Because we all want to be able to do everything that social media can do and more. right? We are not beholden to their limits on creativity. We actually have a few indie web camps coming up. Berlin, anyone here from Europe? Anyone? Can't see. A few folks. Well, if you happen to be near Berlin or can get there, this is the weekend before US Thanksgiving, November 23rd, 24th, I'll be there. We're hosting it at Mozilla. Complimentary, of course. Um, there's San Francisco, December 7th and 8th. And uh, just announcing today, and ticketing is now live, which means it's like really nice and accessible, like any bar camp, uh, Austin, Texas, next year, February 22nd, 23rd. How many of y'all like good barbecue? <laughs> yeah, okay, I know this crowd. Austin's got a lot of that. And then finally, we actually opened up ticketing for the annual IndieWeb Summit as well, next June in Portland, where we invite folks from all around the world to get together and talk about all the latest things happening. It's kind of like WordCamp for the IndieWeb. Meet some folks that interact with folks that build other solutions as well. Because I think that's the thing that we all share in common. Those, word, those WordPress principles I talked about, you might find there are a lot of people out there that share them beyond, beyond the community here. And that's kind of a nice thing. So do those steps. Choose your identity online. Own your content. Choose your connections. And own your experience. And then maybe, just maybe, you can take back your web. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, we have time for a small handful of questions of a little over five minutes or so. So if you have one, please raise your hand. I'll run the mic to you. Hi. Uh, my Hello. name is Brianna Privet. We're 
talking to tech people, and we are all familiar with building websites here, but I think what we aren't hearing conversations about as much, and I'm wondering, and my question is, a big reason that these walled gardens and social networks really hit mass, you know, critical mass was because of the buy-in from non-technical people. Um, our moms, our grandmothers, our families. In How do we use these tech solutions to keep our ability or to share private family moments, public family moments? You know, how do we get our non-technical people on board with moving away from the more problematic social networks and something that they're, that we have more control over? It's a great question. Yeah, that's a big challenge. Um, and beyond, I, I want to even broaden that, beyond non-technical folks, um, there's plenty of technical folks that don't have time to maintain their own website, right? Like, that's a privilege. Like, those of us that like to hack on our websites, it's like a hobby. Well, it's not everyone's hobby. Um, there's plenty of technical folks that, that want to do all this stuff too, and we have to be able to reach them. So the key there, in my opinion, is steering folks that don't want to invest the time you know, in maintaining a website, all that, towards turnkey services. Right now, the best option for that is micro.blog. It's a small paid service. It costs, you know, maybe it costs less than 10% the cost of a, pay, of a, of a cell phone, right? We, we think about how much we spend on day-to-day -day items, and we think about you know, where do we put our time and attention. So a paid service like that, I would say, is the best recommendation. Um, if you're willing to do some of the administration uh, for your non-technical friends or other friends that don't want to administrate their own web website, another option, especially for this crowd, uh, is literally to set them up with their own WordPress, with the plugins with the IndieWeb plugins that make that work for them. Because once those are set up and configured, like that's, a part, that's something that, that y'all can help out with. Um, the person using WordPress, it should be all seamless for. And if it's not, well, you know how to file bugs on plugins, and we can keep making them better, as we should. Um, those are the two recommendations I would give for that. And I, I agree, that's definitely the goal. We gotta, we gotta bring folks that are currently hooked into these systems they don't necessarily want to be, but they don't feel like they have a choice. And like you said, they want to share private photos. They want to share things like that. Um, you know, WordPress has protected posts. You can share posts with just a limited set of folks. And more broadly, that's something the IndieWeb community has been looking into. How do we do that across systems? Um, there are some protocol work. There's a protocol called IndieAuth that allows you to use your own identity, your own domain name, as a way to give permission and to receive permission to see protected or limited audience posts. So that work is underway, and there are plugins working on making that work as well. Um, but at least if we can get folks started with what they publicly sharing and reading using a solution that's not one of the walled gardens, I think that would be great. And they'll just notice that they're having a better experience and being less upset. Hi, Tantek. Uh, great talk. I'm in the back here. Okay. Guy with the big mustache. How you doing? <laughs> My name's Mark. Uh, lots of great insights. Really appreciate your taking the time to share. I'm wondering if you could give the um, kind of your nickel overview of Tim Berners-Lee's contract for the web and what he's trying to do there. So Tim, Tim Berners-Lee, how many of y'all know who Tim Berners-Lee is? Okay, most folks. Tim Berners-Lee is the founder and inventor of the fundamental technologies that basically kicked off the web, HTML, HTTP, and URL. And Tim has also been very concerned about this. I mean, imagine having invented the web and then watching it turn into all those things that I was pointing out. Uh, he posted recently about this contract for the web that he wants uh, folks to stand up for and represent you know, fighting against disinformation, fighting against abuse on the web. And I think that's great. Uh, I, think, I think words matter. I think actions matter more. So in my opinion, the best way that you can uphold and put forth like the values that we all share as a community for a better web is to be a part of that better web and set a good example, just like each and every one of those speakers is that I showed you. So does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Do we have time for any more? How are we doing? Yeah, we're going to get uh, two more questions in here. Okay, cool. 
Hi there. Um, so I was born in 1988, and uh, I kind of you know, grew up alongside the web, had tech-savvy parents, so I understand the importance of the web, I feel like. My cousins were born in the mid-2000s, and I'd say their first exposure, or earliest exposure to technology was the iOS app store, YouTube, Instagram. Um, so their, their kind of take on, on the internet is probably very different. So my question is, uh, do you think there are any uh, special challenges or considerations we have to take into account with the younger generation that may not understand the importance of the web and its value? Great question. I, I myself have a nephew who's 15, and so I kind of, I'm kind of wrestling with those same questions. Um, I even went and, like, back when he was born, like, registered a Twitter account for his name just because I was like, oh, maybe he'll want Twitter. <sighs> <laughs> exactly. I haven't even bothered to, like, because he doesn't care. Um, I think that, especially with folks that are just starting to come of age, especially with folks that are youth, um, they, they are going to get a different experience with the Apple App Store or Android Store, any of those, and with some of these like walled garden silos. Uh, I guess the most I could offer is start them out with uh, keeping all their content private to begin with. Um, I think kids need safe spaces to experiment and, and play around, kind of like we did on the web back then, back when no one was looking, it felt like. Uh, and so we kind of had this like effective anonymity because no one cared or it was just a few folks or there wasn't a massive search engine that was optimizing clicks for ads. Um, so I think it's fine that kids are using these app stores, using the different apps and all that if they're keeping their content private. And if that content goes away, maybe that's okay. Like they're just experimenting. They're not even sure like what they want to do with their online presence, right? That's, that's a whole conversation. That's worth having. But then when they start asking the right questions, like, hey, why can't uh, you know, I comment from one of these to the other, or why do I always need to create a new account? Like, eventually, they'll start to feel the same kind of uh, you know, tiredness that a lot of us have felt from like yet another silo, yet another account, or why did my photo get deleted, or all these, all these like, little paper cuts that over time add up. And, Eventually, one of those will become a teaching moment. And I think that's, that's the proper time to like, educate folks, hey, there is this thing called the web. What you're using, whether it's Instagram, is just this very small part of it. And did you know you could actually have complete control over what you posted there and how it looked and how people experienced it? It might seem like a revolutionary concept to them, something that we've taken for granted, like you said, since 88. Um, but I, I, would, I would start with that. It's okay to let them experiment in private spaces like that. Um, and when they're ready to, and they're asking the right questions, take advantage of those teachable moments. Hi, Tante. It's Cam Barrett. Hey. Hey, hey Cam. Hey. Um, it's been a while. Yeah, it has. Um, I started blogging 22 years ago, and I've got thousands and thousands of posts on there. But somewhere around 2004, 2005, I'm, I started putting all my content on Facebook. So I've got 15, 14, 15 years of content on Facebook that I don't know how to get that content out of Facebook and import it into my WordPress site. Um, there's got to be some tools or something to do that. And then secondly, if I move all my content from Facebook to uh, my blog, um, how do I get my readers on Facebook to come to my blog and interact there? Yeah. Great questions. So, so Cam, I've known Cam for a while. We've seen each other. I think South by Southwest is when we met, probably. Uh, you've got all this content on Facebook or on Twitter. I've got a lot on Twitter as well. Um, fortunately, they still let you export all of it. And there's been a couple of members in the indie web community who have actually successfully exported all of their Facebook content and imported it in, into their personal site. Now, I'm pretty sure one of them used WordPress and one of them used another CMS called Known. But it is possible. Um, it wasn't Chris Aldrich. It was um, Jonathan Lecour. Jonathan Lecour. Yeah, thank you. He actually went even further and like deleted his, his whole entire Facebook as well, which is, you know, good for him. A big step. One of the things you can do is every single one of these platforms has a place where you can say, "This is my website. Go find me there." Right. So at least start doing that now. Like, that's something you can do without even any export, import. 
is like make it clear on your profiles where your personal site is so that at least the folks that are curious are like, oh, I wonder how she or they express themselves online somewhere else on their own personal site. And they can go find that. The second is, uh, so Jonathan LaCour has actually posted a ton of scripts that, must, that like take and process that entire Facebook export into standard formats that then he can import into CMSs. And I'm willing to bet that there's a lot of that that you could probably reuse. I know you're very technical, um, so you'd probably be able to tackle that in its current state. Now, ideally, we'd get to a point where it was turnkey. Like, ideally, I would love to be able to sign up someplace like micro.blog, give it like OAuth re read access, maybe read write access to my Facebook, and say, import everything and delete. How amazing would that be? We're not there yet. That would be, that's an ideal. That's where we need to get to. But until we get there, for those of us that do maintain our own CMSs and have some confidence with like databases and import export, there are scripts and things to at least get you started. Cool. All right, thank you again, Tentic. Can I get another round of applause for Tentic Chell, please? So uh, thank you for coming. This is the last session in this room. The State of the Word starts at 4 o'clock in the 220 rooms, which are across the atrium on the same floor. No technical questions this way. Mm -hmm.